Hello and welcome back to my channel, Quirky What If. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the second part of our series, What If Deku Like Ock Becomes Flash? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Terius123 from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Chapter 10, Aftermath. After the whole debacle and the villains are all arrested, both me and Midori along with All Might are taken to the nurse's office for treatment by Recovery Girl. Both Aizawa and Thirteen have grave wounds that need surgery so they are sent to the hospital immediately. The trip back to school is really tense. I still can't believe how dumb I was to not figure out that I got involved in the plot since the start of the semester. I mean, the two protagonists of the series are my classmates for God's sake. How did I even miss that? Other than that, I have noticed both All Might and Midoriya's stares towards me. I shouldn't have said the Quirk's name out loud. They are this world's greatest secret, after all. Just knowing their names must have sent warnings that I know a lot more than I let on, which to be fair, I didn't remember until just hours ago. But if that's the case, then the plot has proceeded as normal. All Might fought the Namu and won, if just barely. Things will go back to normal with the sports festival and then the workplace training oh god. Workplace training, where Ida's brother suffered an attack from Stain and is left paralyzed from the waist down. Which then leads to Ida going full Sasu can seek vengeance against him. All of that would happen a few weeks down the line. What I do? I want to help, but what if doing that changes the plot to a point that it made things worse? What if just by doing such a thing, Ida didn't learn from his mistake and choose not to help in the whole rescue Beck Hugo thing? Without his help, they would have an even smaller chance of even rescuing him or even surviving, considering that it was Ida that has stopped Midoriya from rushing to his death. But should I just leave a potential victim for the sake of a future good that will end up doing? Is that what a hero should do? God, I wish I have remained ignorant about the whole thing. At least I've no need to fuss over this dilemma. Once we reached the nurse's office, recovery girl went to work healing and bandaging up the injured parties. I was the last one to get patch up considering the severity of my wound is mostly due to bleeding and infection, something that take a less priority than broken limbs and cracked ribs. Your wrist should be fine. You managed to apply first aid in time. She tells me as she handed me a few wrapped candies after bandaging up my wrist properly. Luckily, it only affected the skin, so your nerves are unharmed for the most part. But if you feel any numbness, please come to me immediately. Yes, ma'am. I muttered as I unwrapped one of them and popped it into my mouth. Huh, Cherry. Was expecting a different flavor. Now about you two. She turns to face All Might and Midoriya, both of them laying on the beds with bandages wrapped around their respective wounds. Due to the situation, I can't exactly scold you guys this time. But you still shouldn't have overdone it, All Might. I know. He stated with a morbid look on his skeleton-looking face. Still can't believe that this is All Might, the same hero with that enormous frame and hopeful smile. I think I may have shortened my time limit gain. I'll be lucky if I can get even an hour per day now. All Might, his fan, successor muttered in anguish. What are you going to do? All Might states as he gets up from the bed, bad things happen. And speaking of bad things, he turns to me and I flinched on the stool I am sitting on. Tatsuya Shoujo, I take it that you have a lot of questions. A lot is a bit of an understatement. I muttered out. But before I can answer that, please answer me this. He stares at me as he asked, why do you know about one for all? I freeze on the spot, no idea on what I should say. What should I even say? That I read all your life story in a manga in another world where I am a normal quirkless person and that I'm actually a reincarnated person from that world and I know everything that is about to happen in the next few months and that you have only until summer before you have to retire from the number one spot and that your greatest enemy will no doubt cause that retirement and your ex-psychic that you have unintentionally abandoned is going to die by fall. Thinking about all that, if I've said all of that out loud, they are going to think I am crazy. I mean, I think I'm crazy. Why can't I just don't remember any of that and just live out my life as the hero in training Tetsuya Jenko? Why do I have to remember all of this now? Tetsuya-san. I can feel Midoriya's innocent-looking gaze at me as I struggle to come up with something. Come on. Anything. Just give him an answer. I. Well, I. This is. The door sliding open became my saving grace as everyone's attention went off me to the person entering the room. It's a tall Japanese man in a brown trench coat pardoning himself from entering while taking off his brown fedora. His features are for the most normal-looking, an average Japanese male's face with the standard black hair and dark eyes. Long time no see, All Might. Tsukachi, a blonde skeleton stated in shock, I didn't know you were here. Ah, uh, All Might is. Ah, uh, is this okay? I hear my classmate cried out in surprise, I mean, you're. Relax, it's fine. Why, you ask? Because this is my favorite detective on the force, good old Naomasa Tsukachi. Aha, uh -huh, thanks for that weird intro. The detective laughed, not to rush you or anything, but I'd like to ask about these villains that attacked you. Wait, before that, are the students all right? The hero asked, in Aizawa. What of Eraserhead? And Thirteen. You never changed, do you? Tsukachi let out a sigh, his expression never changing. 
Besides your two kids over there, the students got nothing more than a few bumps and bruises. And the two teachers all got out fine. It is thanks to you three heroes for putting your lives on the line for them that they made it out unscathed. I see. That's good to hear. All might sigh in relief, but you got one thing wrong, Tsukachi. In this fight, all the students have put their lives on the line too. To be thrown into a real battle so young and early in their education, and survived. Now these first years know how scary the big bad world can be. Have you ever heard of such a class? These foolish villains picked the wrong fight. For thanks to this experience, the members of Class 1 will grow to become some of the mightiest heroes. I'm going to make sure of that. I honestly wasn't sure what to make of it. To be complimented by the number one hero like this, for him to state his faith in our growth like that. It's an honor beyond believed. Almost made me forget that the world is going to be facing a large shift in the near future. I see. Good to know. The detective nodded. Great speech and all, but I would really need to be getting those statements from you, if that's not too much to ask. Oh, no. Of, of course not. Midori is stated out nervously, I'll ask away. I think I'll start with the least injured in the room. He chuckles, Tetsuya Jenko-san. Please come with me. Oh, oh, of course. I got up from my stool before following the detective out of the room. Tetsuya Shoujo. I flinched at the number one hero's voice, please keep my condition a secret from everyone. You mustn't tell anyone about this. Okay. Of course. I nodded before continuing out of the room with Tsukachi in the lead. Wouldn't tell anyone even if I'm paid to speak. The world depends on it, after all. The questioning didn't go for very long. The detective mostly asked about the sequence of events from my perspective, what happened and why did I do it, the standard witness testimony. And I answered truthfully and tries to explain everything to the best of my ability. After answering them all, he thanked me and then gave me a small lecture on the law on the use of quirks and self-defense before letting me go. The very moment I left the room, I was met with two very worried faces in the corridor. Jenko, are you okay? Teku cried as he shook my shoulders violently when I heard what happened. T. Teku S. Stop. I stuttered out as I managed to pull away from his grip, I'm fine. A little injured wrist is all. I raised my bandaged wrist for them to see. Shinsu let out a sigh of relief, that's good news. So, what happened? Villains attacked the USJ. You went to the USJ for training. Teku cried out in shock, so lucky. Damn it, I wanted to go there since we were ten. No, no, not the theme park. I corrected him. Thirteen really need to change that name. It's a training facility that has the same letters. But it would be awesome to go there, though. Jenko. Oh, all right. I let myself wander off tangent for a bit there. Got to stop doing that. There is this large portal guy that teleported like a hundred baddies with their leader. Aizawa sensei went to stall them to let us escape, but then the portal guy appears in front of the door stopping us. Bakugu and Kirishima went to try and stop him, but then he teleports all of us away. I ended up in the water with Midoriya and Tsuyu, where there are villains waiting for us. The next part is a bit long so I'll keep it short. We managed to beat the bad guys, try to get to the stairs but then stopped when this Hulk looking dude wrecks Aizawa sensei. Then the leader attack us, All Might shows up, bam bam boom, heroes win, villain run, and then I'm here. I think you missed out the best parts, Teku pointed out. Hey, when All Might arrives, the heroes always win. I noted, before mentally dreading what I just said. Thinking back, the idea of All Might being able to save everyone is really ingrained into our society's subconscious. Once he is gone, and your wrist, Shinsu asked. The leader has the quirk that disintegrates anything he touches. Got my wrist, but luckily the nerves seem to be intact. I demonstrate by giving him a peace sign on my injured hand. Oh, hey, Jenko. Teku suddenly asked, are you really doing fine? Yeah, I'm okay. I grin for him, it's a bit scary, but it's learning experience. Just you wait, I'll be a hero faster than any of you. If the plot doesn't try to kill me later down the line. Remind myself to find a hotline for the faculty office later. All right, if you say so. He nodded with a smile. Oh, Teku, if only you knew about the amount of problems that I would be going to get myself into in the near future. Oh, Tetsuya-kun. A voice calls out as Cementos walks up to us, glad to catch you before you left school. Principal Neza wishes to speak with you. The principal, Shinsu asked curiously, why? Is she in trouble? I'm afraid I can't say too much. I got it. I nodded as I walked towards him with the teacher leading, you guys go back without me. Jenko, it'll be fine. I told Shinsu, nothing to worry about. As Jenko walks away with teacher in the lead, Shinsu turns to his friend, Teku having a worried expression on his face. She's doing it again. The brown-haired teen tells him. Again. Every time she is troubled, she always just smiles and tell me it is fine. He explained, that hasn't changed since we were in kindergarten. You think that something happened in the USJ troubles her? Shinsu asked. Yeah. He nodded, but I doubt she'll tell us the truth if we asked. On our way to the principal's office, I couldn't help feeling like a culprit about to be outed for my crimes. All Might, or at least Recovery Girl must have told him about what I muttered out back in USJ. And knowing that Nezu is quite a smart fellow, I can't help but fear my future here in this school. How am I going to explain myself? I mean, knowledge of one for all is strictly a secret for various reasons, and for me, an average high school girl happening to find out about it. I doubt there's little I can do to hide the truth from them. 
But would they even believe the truth, that I am a reincarnation from another world that happens to have this world's greatest story told in a manga book? How is anyone is going to think if I said that? We're here, Cementos tells me as we stand in front of a door with the words written clearly on the plaque over it. The concrete hero knocks on the door, pardoning himself before opening the door. The office is a large room with a few cabinets on the side that houses several files and books with a few photo frames decorating the walls along with a large lone clock ticking in on the wall in the corner. At the end of the room lies a large wooden desk where Nezu is sitting, his eyes unchanging as usual but I get a sense that he is observing me for some reason. Ah, Tetsuya-kun. He greeted, come in, come in. I enter the room as Cementos closes the door behind me, please, take a seat. I walk up to the desk and sat down on chair offered, I believe you know why I asked of you. Is it about All Might? I asked worriedly. Yes, yes, that one. He nodded, but before that, would you like some tea? He pushes a teacup towards me, the scent of freshly brewed green tea teases my nostrils. Oh, um, thank you. I pick up the cup and sips a little. This is definitely not the instant kind. The warm feeling of hot tea in my stomach somewhat calms down the butterflies in my guy, my nerves slowly and steadily ease off. Tetsuya-kun. Nezu speaks at me with a somewhat benevolent tone. I can assure you that as a principal of Yui, I would do no harm to any student of our lovely campus. Whatever you may say, it will be of the privacy in this room. Nothing will leave this room unless I say so. I place my cup back on the table as I processed what he just said. So, he's assuring me that I won't be punished too badly. That this is not an interrogation. Is that what the tea is about? But despite his kind demeanor, I can't help but remember that scene where he is playing around with Kaminari and Ashido during their end-of-term exams. Under all that, lies a dangerously smart individual. Cute, but dangerous. With that being said, he crosses his hands. Pause. May I ask how do you know about One for All? There it is. The question that I am fearing. Dozens of possible replies races through my mind as I try to come up with an excuse as to how I know such thing. But no matter what I came up with, I can't help fearing that Nezu will just see right through it regardless, that I would be cornered all the same. How can I not? Nezu is considered one of the smartest people of this world, proven fact with countless of articles about him that I found out due to curiosity. And if all options of lying are deemed impossible, then the only option left is... Are you familiar with the term, reincarnation? You mean the cycle of rebirth that is so prevalent in Buddhism and Hinduism? He asked, yes, I am quite familiar with that concept. Why? Well, I blurted out everything. My situation as a reincarnated human that somehow reborn into this world with the memories of my past life mostly intact, to the fact that this world was nothing but fiction from my previous life's world. The entire truth is laid out in front of him, no lies and no half-truths. After everything is said and done, I took a sip of my tea as I await the verdict nervously. What's going to happen now? Is everything you said true? Yes. I nodded, well, not all of it. There are things that have changed due to me being born here. Like mine of being in class 1B instead of 1A, or the fact that Teku is even in the school to begin with. I, C. He nods in response, then in just a few short months. A symbol of peace will. He looked at me. His eyes seemed to reflect some signs of understanding and a bit of pity. You can be assured that nothing you said will leave this room. Will you tell All Might about this? I asked worriedly. That's up to me to worry about, Tetsuya-kun. He smiled as he glanced at the clock on the wall. I've took up too much of your time already. Why don't you head on home? Classes are cancelled for tomorrow so take the time to get some well-deserved rest. Thank you, sir. I bowed politely to him before I made my way to the door. Tetsuya-kun. His voice stopped me just as I had my hand on the handle. I'm proud of you with what you did today. You may not be there yet, but I can see the great heroine you'll become in the future. Keep up your studies and work hard. I turned to him, bowed once more before leaving the room behind me. The moment I reached my room, I didn't even bother changing out of my uniform as I tosses my bag to one side and plopped face first right onto my bed. I am exhausted, mentally and physically. The whole debacle with the USJ has sucked everything out of me, and the thing about me realizing that I unknowingly got sucked into the plot despite the signs of it screaming right in my face. Again, why did I have to remember it? I'd rather be ignorant of the entire thing than worry about the eventual downfall of the era of All Might. Or even the fact the re-emergence of All for One. That guy creeps me out. Hug. Huh. Nonetheless, I know remember the whole plot now. Better write things down to plan for future trouble. With that thought in mind, I hesitantly got up and dug into my drawer for a spare sketchbook to chart out the whole plot. Let's see. The latest chapter I've read ended with the whole endeavor trying to make up for his past sins to his family so once that has passed, I'm running blind. Now for the next few events. The sports festival will come regardless of what I do, so I'll just leave it be and have fun in it. That reminds me, I better start sparring with Teku and Shinsu again. Need to keep in shape for the tournament if I'm going to make any impression. I need to find a substitute way to gain charge beside using a battery. After that is, the workplace training with the fight against Stain. Stain has always been a favorite villain for the fans since his introduction. From his anti-hero work for his own idealistic version of heroes, to his undying resolve to carry out his ideal to the end, there is a lot to like about him. Heck, if I have to do a top 10 villains in anime, Stain is probably be one of the candidates. But now it's different. Stain isn't some fictional character anymore. 
He's a living person and a major threat that need to be stopped. It is thanks to him that Ida's brother got paralyzed which then lead our class rep to track him down for revenge at your style. But even if I hate it, I can't really do anything. I'm just some high school girl. A super powered high school girl, but a high school girl still. There are things that I can't do. This isn't the world of Naruto, where kids can become adult far earlier than they should. So then, what should I do? Nothing, I suppose. If it goes according to the plot, everything will work out eventually. Sure, there will be some bumps in the road, but no one would actually die, at least not during that arc. But, can I live with myself if I let it all happen? That with the price of a hero's career, and proper hero nonetheless, this great evil will be taken down. That for the events that lead up to Stain's capture to occur, the sacrifice of a lone hero is necessary. For the price of the few, the many will be saved. I quoted one hero of justice. Is this the cruel reality that I have to face? That I would have to make this choice? No, there was never a choice to begin with. If I can't even save one person, what kind of hero will I be? I know this path is filled with hardships the moment I chose to become a hero. Even so, I've chose to walk on it. I won't quit, not when I just left the starting line. If I can't make it past this hurdle, then I have no right to become a hero. I will save him. I have to. It's my duty to do so. To be continued, I'll make Tetsu screwed in the last bolt in place before taking a few steps back. There. Done. What do you think? It's a bit tight around the chest. His middle school sister answers. She wearing a large harness that covers the entire body with two metallic bracers around her wrists that has two small gas cylinders connected to it and has wires trailing up her arm to the metallic backpack. Along with a motorcycle helmet covering her entire head, is it supposed to be like this? Must have grown. He mutters to himself before turning back to her, does it hurt anywhere else? HM, not really. Then it'll be fine. He turns to his assistants, camera, ready. Teku raises the device and gives him a thumbs up. Emergency call on speed dial. Shinsu shows his phone with the ambulance number already dialed in, okay. Now, Jenko, if you are feeling any discomfort or pain, please let us know. Got it, right. He took a look around their test site. An abandoned warehouse that is technical college owned for testing purposes with several mattresses lying about. Ready to record in. He raises his finger up and counts down, three, two. He closed his fist as Teku presses the record button. This is movement harness prototype, test 15 of the pull test. I've lowered the speed of the motor for the pulley system since the previous test ended up with a little. Complication. I was shot through the roof. Shinsu voices out angrily. Regardless. He ignores him as he continues, I believe that with this test, we may have finally fixed the problem. You say that the last 14 times, too. Teku added in. Hey, who's the inventor here? Tetsu asked rather angrily, now, beginning test. Jen Chan, you ready? Ready. She aimed towards one of the warehouse's pillars a good distance away, her thumb gliding over the button on the bracer closest to it, shooting in three. Two. She presses down. Something shoots out of the top of it and latches into the concrete pillar, hook set. Starting reeling sequence. You know, you don't have to say it like that. Teku commented. But it's more fun that way. She noted as she lets go of the button, the line starts reeling back in and pulling her forward with it. At first, it seems okay. But then she starts to speed up and up till she overshoots the pillar, pulling out the hook in the process and she is sent flying while screaming. A second later, a loud crash can be heard as Jenko lands face first into the cushion wall in front of her. Jen Chan, Jenko. The three guys rush towards her as she slides off the wall and collapses on the mattress below. You okay? Her brother asked worriedly. Guess it still needs more adjustments, huh? Shinsu noted. You don't say. Tetsu commented dryly. Look at all the birdies. Chapter 11, Day Off. I am awakened to the sun shining in my face. I reluctantly open my eyes as the glare of the morning sun burns into my sight. Feeling the hard surface on my face, I concluded that I have fallen asleep on my table, and mostly likely drooled over my sketchbook too. I quickly raise my head in response to that thought, and breathing a sigh of relief over the lack of drool on the paper before checking the time on my phone. 10 a.m., that's a lot later than I normally would have liked. I've found myself a morning person over the years, never waking up so late before with exception like that time when I got sick with the flu. I must be a lot tired than I originally thought. I didn't even realize that I've fallen asleep at all, if the lack of dreams means anything. I didn't even change into my sleepwear if the familiar feeling of my school uniform on me is to be believed. Although, I am grateful that I have no dreams last night, or nightmares about what happened back there. The last thing I need is nightmare attacks. Looking down at the sketchbook, I took note of the timeline I have written out on one of the pages with bullet points on the events happening on the opposite page and where as well as the cause and trigger for said event. I've written down every major event that I could remember, leading all the way to the part where Endeavor tries to redeem himself. With this, even if my memory fails me, there's still this to remind me of what is going to happen. Of course, all of that may go to the gutter if my presence means anything. For one, there might be certain events which may happen very differently due to my presence alone. The countless possibilities and routes are endless and I could only fear what that may entrails. Okay, stop, stop, stop thinking such negative thoughts. I mutter to myself as I slaps my cheeks a few times. 
If what happened isn't going in accordance to what I remember, then I just have to improvise. Even the most prepared plans have loopholes, and to come up with a counteraction on the fly is the mark of a pro hero, after all. Putting the sketchbook aside, I notice a pair of sticky notes on the corner of the table. On one of them reads, while the other reads, they must have left when I was asleep. Kind of them to leave a note for me. But investigation. Yes, they still have some things left to inspect about the whole trespassing. Then, it hits me. Dad. He is part of the faculty, which means he knows about All Might's time limit and true state of being. And some of the teachers might tell him about me finding out, which would be the most logical choice to make. I mean, I know one of the largest secrets in the entire nation. And that's not mentioning the truth of one for all and all for one. And when he finds out, a shiver runs down my spine at the thought of facing him. Not my father Tetsuya Maki, but the pro hero Hermes. My situation just keeps getting better and better, doesn't it? Leaving my room, I'm greeted with a plate of fluffy pancakes on the dining table with a bottle of syrup and butter next to it. Happy though I may be for the best breakfast I could have gotten. The fact that mom even cooked it also means that she knows about the incident and is probably worried about me. I have some of the best parents out there, don't I? I don't want to worry them too much but with the major plot points coming after the sports festival. Shaking my head to clear those depressing thoughts, I gladly take my plate of breakfast goodies and move over to the coffee table to enjoy it with the TV. Turning it on, the first thing that shows up is the news, reporting on about the recent break-in yesterday. It has been a day since the prestigious hero school Yui High was infiltrated by a group of villains who call themselves the League of Villains. The newscaster drones on, no one knows why this criminal group would even infiltrate Yui and how they got past the defenses they have put up, but what we do know is the effect it has on the credibility of the nation's number one hero school. People has starts to point out. The news just went into details covering the incident as I dug into my pancake meal with gusto. Despite the sweetness of the syrup and from the pancakes themselves, I find my mood just souring over the news. The way the interviewed public starts talking about the incident, on how it tarnishes the good reputation of Yui and its security. All of it just reminds me of the major event that will signal the end of the era of All Might, the incident that will change the entire society in the whole, good and bad. And all of it started with the trespassing of the school by, in lack of a better term, superpowered thugs. Cleaning my plate of my breakfast delight, I turn off the TV with a tired sigh. The reminder of the end of All Might's career as a symbol of peace really left a bad taste in my mouth, even more than knowing the series of events that lead up to it. All Might will retire as a pro hero, that much is a guarantee and no amount of planning is going to change it. Even if I manage to prevent Bakugou from being kidnapped, the wounds he has suffered from all for one's hands along with his depleting power would force him to step down eventually, if not this year then maybe the next. The days of All Might's era is ending soon, and knowing that it is something that I could never prevent is soul crushing. Damn it, I'm doing it again. I mutter out as I put my plate into the sink, there's no point in thinking about stuff like that. I really need to stop doing that. And sitting around at home is just going to make those thoughts louder. Maybe I'll take a walk. That might clear my head a little. Deciding on that, I got away from the kitchen sink and head for my room to change. The sudden turn however swipes my hair into my face, and the sour scent burns my nostrils. Okay, shower first, then go for a walk. A quick shower and a change of clothes later, I'm out on the streets just wandering about. Maybe I'll head for the shopping district nearby to do some window shopping, and maybe check out the library. A bit of reading might stomp away those nasty thoughts of mine. Glancing up reveals the blue skies with a few clouds just floating about, the warm spring breeze blowing into my hair every couple of minutes. I've decided to dress a little light for the warm spring season, a blue t-shirt with white stripes on the side and a pair of dark green knee-length shorts with a pair of red sneakers with gray soles. Passing into the shopping district, I took a look around the different clothing shop display, taking note of the recent fashion. I pass by a flower shop that is having a sale on roses of all things, even peeking into the pet shop with a few cute little rabbits nibbling away at their leafy meals. This is better. No thoughts about the impending danger, just a good day to be outside. This is exactly what I needed. Maybe I'll take another look at those cute rabbits. Oh, Tetsuya-san. I was then stopped in my tracks when a familiar voice calls out to me. Turning around, I took notice of, to my utmost surprise, Kirishima of all people walking to me in a patterned v-neck shirt under opened red hoodie and a pair of jeans and red sneakers. I am surprised, what are you doing in the same neighborhood? Oh, Kirishima-san. I greeted back. What a coincidence. I didn't know you live in the same area. Same here. What are you up to? Just a walk. Being coop up at home is driving me nuts. How about you? He asked, his gaze looking down towards my hand. Is your hand okay? Oh, it's fine. Nothing too damaging, according to Recovery Girl. I explain as I raise my bandaged hand to show him. The wound still looks a little raw despite Recovery Girl's treatment, so I cover it up with bandages before I went out. Hopefully it would heal up by tomorrow morning and not leave a scar. That's a relief. And you? I asked, are you doing okay from yesterday? Oh, me. I'm totally fine. Just a few bruises here and there, nothing to worry about. He stated with a toothy grin flexing his arm which sharpens with his hardening quirk. If there's one thing that's good about my quirk, is that I can hardly get hurt. Much, anyways. 
Yeah, I definitely see that. Speaking of getting hurt, that reminds me. You went to the infirmary with Midoriya and All Might, right? He asked, are they fine? I mean, All Might is All Might, but Midoriya doesn't look that good back then. Both of them are fine, if I remember right. Midoriya-san doesn't seem that badly hurt the last time I saw them. I'm sure they are fine. Recovery Girl has healed his broken legs within seconds the first time. Not to mention that All Might mostly got away with his surgical wounds opening up which she patched up pretty neatly yesterday. If you exclude All Might's time limit decreasing by an hour or so, they are perfectly fine. That's good news. He lets out a sigh that has been bugging me all of last night. Huh, that's not what I expect to hear from him of all people. Come to think of it, the manga did show the more vulnerable side of him in his past. Wasn't there a point which he nearly stopped trying to become a hero because he felt he wasn't good enough to be one? I it's nothing, really. He noted, it's just a small thing. No big deal. Okay, man, he looks rather gloomy compared to his usual energetic self. Guess the incident left a bigger mark on him than I originally thought. My mind then went to one of the more later arcs, in which he plays a pivotal role in securing victory in a certain mission. He will bounce back, stronger and tougher than ever, that much I am certain of. G-R-O-O-O-W-W-W-L-L-L. I felt my face burning as I clenched my stomach in sheer embarrassment. Damn it, stomach, why do you have to be so loud today? And right in front of one of my classmates too. Oh yeah, it's way past noon now. Kirishima noted as he looks at his phone. I look at mine as well, the time shown being past two in the afternoon. I must have lost track of time wandering about. I did spend quite a long time looking into the pet shop just now. Those little bunnies are just too cute. You know, um, I think there's a small cafe down that street. He then pointed out to me, want to grab a bite with me. Are you sure? I asked, I don't want to bother you. It's not like I have anything better to do. Well, in that case, thank you, please come again. As he walks out of the cake store, Teku looked down at the box of cake he has in his possession. A simple strawberry shortcake, the only thing that wouldn't dent his allowance. Hopefully, this would make Jenko feel better. Knowing his own childhood friend, she is probably either sulking over something or keep on brooding over it. Despite her outgoing and cheery nature, she has a bad habit of keeping anything bad to herself. But if there is one thing that he knows will cheer her up is, it is sweets. Or more accurately, cakes and pastries of all sorts. For as long as he known her, she has a notorious sweet tooth. Whenever she is either in a bad mood or just sulking, a simple cream puff is more than enough to lighten the mood. And thankfully, the shop that she is a big fan of has a sale on their cakes today. Now then, he mumbles to himself as he took out his phone, I wonder if she is home right now HM. Across the street, passing on by is the friend in question with one of her classmates, Kirishima if he remembers his name correctly. He doesn't know much about him, the times they meet is during lunch break and even then, they rarely ever interacted with each other. Huh, so he stays in the same neighborhood as us. And then, a gaze to the right later, he took notice of a pink-skinned girl about his age peeking at the two from behind a shop's billboard along with what seems to be floating clothes that form a somewhat feminine silhouette. The both of them donning a pair of sunglasses and fake mustache each. Okay, what in the actual? What? As soon as Jenko and Kirishima enters a small cafe, the two girls as stealthy as they can sneak after them, which raises even more questions for him. This is not how I plan today to go at all. I can pay for my own food, you know. I pointed out, hey, what kind of man I be if I let a woman pay? He stated, it's kind of annoying. Well, too bad. Letting out a sigh, I took a bite at my BLT sandwich as I took a glance at the person that I'm having my late lunch with. The last thing I was expecting from this day off of mine is to get treated by Kirishima again. Despite my insistence, he ended up paying for my part of the meal, a simple set meal with a sandwich that comes with a drink of any choice which I'd pick a grape soda. He picked the same, only it is grilled chicken and he chooses cola. What is with him in not letting me pay for my food? Is this something to do about his quest for manliness or something? I mean, I get the whole chivalrous mindset, but even so, there has to be a limit to all of that. At least let a girl buy her own lunch. It's not like we're dating or anything. Got to say, this is a nice place. I added in, the price isn't that steep, even for a cafe, the food is good, but it doesn't seem like the type of place you would go. Yeah, it isn't. He shrugged his shoulders in response, but a classmate from middle school once told me that girls like this kind of places. And I kind of want to made it up to you for last time. Oh, guess that time with at the ramen store didn't sit well with him. Come to think of it, I think I saw him getting scolded by Ashido the day after. Ramen and teenage girls don't really mix, after all. Then again, I'm not like other girls out there. With me being a reincarnation and all that. That would explain that time with Ashido. I commented out loud. Yeah, she really tears into me for what I did. He groans out. But I had a good time back then. I pointed out, Kirishima looking at me with a surprised look, I like ramen, and the stores is pretty good. Not to mention the whole food challenge thing was a blast. Oh yeah. You really surprised me. I've never seen someone eat so much so fast before, let alone a girl. He am a master food warrior, I have you know. I once defeated the infamous giant log cake challenge. No way. The one where you have to finish like three whole Swiss roll cakes within 30 minutes. I've tried that and I barely made it through one when the time went out. 
Oh yeah, she did that. A voice suddenly interjects itself into our conversation, and a glance to my right reveals Teku standing there with a somewhat deadpanned, surprised look on his face in a red shirt and blue jeans. When I saw the plastic bag in his hand and the logo on it, my mind immediately stopped and the realization of its contents filled it as I can feel my mouth waters a little. And boy does she has a stomachache after that. Is that bag from the winged cat store? I almost shouted in excitement. Yeah, strawberry shortcake. He nodded with a grin, there's a sale on it, so I got it. Is it for me? Why else would I get it? Thank you, Teku. I jumped and tackle him in a hug, best friend forever. As soon as I let go him, he passes the plastic bag to me with a somewhat red-cheeked expression, which I gratefully accept as I twirls around with it humming happily. Today may start out sad and depressing, but it turns out great in the end. The future arcs may be looming over me, but despite knowing that, I am now confident that I'll be able to handle whatever that comes my way. That's what heroes do, after all. To be continued, I'll make, those this happens often. Kirishima asked curiously as he watches at his classmates spinning around holding on the plastic bag. More than you know it, Teku stated, by the way, I like to point out the two stalkers you have. The red-haired teen follows his finger to the table opposite them, the two girls sitting there flinched who are unaware of how obvious they are right now. Even with the disguise they don, it is obvious who they are. Ashido, Hagatur, Heha, <laughs> busted, Mina sheepishly rubbing the back of her head with her invisible partner in crime. We saw you guys talking, so we want to see if you will do it right this time. Hagakure explained, plus tailing you guys are fun. And I thought my classmates are quirky. Teku mutters to himself, as his childhood friend continues twirling without a care in the world. Chapter 12, Upcoming Sports Festival. Classes restarted on the very next day. And it was hectic. I barely made it to class, with reporters still skulking about the district and ambushing our students left and right. I nearly got ambushed myself, if Teku hasn't pulled me away from their microphones. I think Shinsu did something with them the moment I wasn't looking. I sure hope he doesn't get into trouble for using his quirk outside of campus. The moment I walked into the classroom, I was immediately pulled to my seat by my invisible classmate and her pink-skinned partner in crime to interrogate me. So, how did it go? Ashido asked excitedly. How did what go? What? She says. Hagakure shouted in agony, your date. With Kirishima. Kirishima. What oh? You mean yesterday? I realized, them nodding to it, that wasn't a date. We just met on the streets and he treated me to a meal. Oh, my god. The horned girl groaned, can you believe this girl? When a guy and a girl have a meal together, that's a date. The invisible schoolgirl stated firmly, didn't you go on dates back in middle school? No, I shrugged at their question, I mean, I have eaten with Teku before. And Shinsu, sometimes both of them together. But those doesn't qualify as dates, doesn't it? Oh god, we have a late bloomer here. And with a face like that, and that bottle line, I raise my eyebrow at their implication. I myself doesn't consider myself a late bloomer, it's more along the lines of not interested. Sure, I have considered maybe settling down one day, but right now I'm more invested into becoming a pro hero first. I'll look for romance after that. If it worked with dad, why not me? Katsuya Chan's lack of romance aside, did any of you guys watch the news last night? Hagakure asked, getting nods from a few of us and me, it's crazy that we've got a few seconds of screen time. But I guess no one notices me hanging out in the background. Well, your costume is just gloves, after all. I pointed out. We are a real big deal now. Kaminari exclaims, the new channels love us. We're basically celebrities. Oh, get over yourself. Jiru tells them, the famous hero course of UUE is attacked by villains, that's all they care about. Who knows what would have happened if the teachers haven't shows up. Siro noted, it's terrifying to think about. Conversations like that pop up left and right about the classroom. Topics like the fight between All Might and Namu as well as our possibly celebrity-like status being talked about left and right. I personally didn't want to think about that time any more than I really have to. After all, being at Ground Zero isn't all great, nearly getting blown away by their exchange isn't something I want to experience again. And speaking of Ground Zero, I took a glance to my left, Midoriya flinched when our eyes meet as he turns his attention to his desk with a slight ting of blush on his cheeks. Almost forgot about this little issue. I'm not sure if the principal has told All Might about what I've told him, and who knows what the symbol of peace would do with that knowledge. If anything, he might be on guard around me from now on. The last thing I need is for the main character to be cautious with me. Come to think of it, compared to later down the road due to the tutelage of Gran Torino, he definitely doesn't have proper training like some of our top-tier classmates. Bakugou is basically the trope of the talented douchebag incarnate so he doesn't count. I wonder if, attention class, Ada suddenly shouted from the podium, homeroom is about to begin. Everyone, please go to your seats. Um, we're already in our seats, Siro points out for him, and Ashido and Hagakure already went back to their desks a moment ago. Dang it. He grumbles I witness him sit back down with a somewhat frustrated scowl on his face. A few seconds later, the door to the classroom slides open to reveal not Aizawa, but Dad instead, good morning, class 1A. He greets us as he slowly walks towards the podium, I know it's not my time period, but with Eraserhead being as injured as he is, I am assigned as his substitute until he recovers. I am glad to have you here, Sensei. Ada greeted, as I am you. 
but sadly, we don't have time for pleasantries right now. He tells us, after all, you all have to face one heck of a battle soon. That caught everyone off guard as we all waited anxiously for him to elaborate. I am panicking in my own head as I wasn't expecting this at all. What battle is there? I mean, I don't think there's anything after the whole USJ arc and the anime didn't provide any fillers like that at all. Of course, I'm talking about the upcoming sports festival. So ordinary. Damn it, don't scare us like that. I shouted. Dad, seriously. You couldn't have start with that first. But wait, is it really such a good idea to host it? Kaminari asked wordly. Didn't villains just sneak in? Jiro added wordly. Yeah, they could all attack again. Ajiro noted. According to the administration, it is a necessity in order to show that the threat has been handled and the school is still as safe as it always has. Additionally, they are planning on beefing up the security for this year. Dad explains, with that being said, the sports festival is an important event that impact all students in Yui. It's not something we can cancel willy-nilly. Because the nation's top heroes will be watching too, right? Yairazu asked, they'll be scouting for us. They'll be looking to hire us as psychics once we graduated. That's how it's done. Kaminari noted. But then some psychics would never manage to go solo. Jiru bit out, they're psychics forever. That'll be you, Kaminari. Jijarja K. Naturally. The emphasis on that word brought everyone's attention back to him as Dad continues to explain, you'll gain valuable experience and popularity if you were to be picked up by a big-named hero. But the window for such a thing is small, miss it and your careers might never take off. So, shows the pros your best, and strive for your future the best possible way you can. You only get one chance per year, which means three chances in your lifetime. If you are planning to be an aspiring hero, this is one event you can't afford to miss out. That means you better work hard and not slack off, understand? Yes, sir. Good, then class is dismissed. Once our class is released for lunch, the excitement from that announcement earlier this morning bursts open, everyone all chattering and talking about what they would do at the festival. And with everyone all busy with their own things, I decide to make my move. Hey, Midoriya. I calls out to the green-haired teen who flinches at my voice, sorry to bother you, but can I talk to you for a moment? In private. SS sure. Ev of course. He nodded nervously. As he went to apologize to his two friends, Ida's eyes met mine. For a moment, he seems to have an intense stare, before he adjusted his glasses and assuring his friend with the same eccentric movements he is known for. Huh, what was that about? We both made it outside to a small corner near the stairs, where there's not much traffic considering it is in the opposite way to the cafeteria. After checking for any possible eavesdropping, I turn my attention back to the future number one hero. He can't stop shaking his knees, his back is hunched forward, and whenever our eyes meet, his eyes immediately look the other way. God damn, it's like I'm looking at a puppy. All those fan art of him is right, he is a damn cinnamon roll. Calm down, will you? I asked worriedly, my frustration leaking into my tone a little, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not Bakugou. I let out a small growl at the same time, it's about all might in you. HRK. I I see. Let me first assure you. I place my hands on his shoulder, noticing that I'm a couple inches taller than him. I would not breathe a word about all might to anyone, or the nature of your quirk to him. Re really? I swear on my heart. Oh okay. Good. I nodded with a smile as I let go his shoulder. He somewhat eases up a little to my relief. And lastly, I want to help you. Huh. He helped me. Yes, help you. I repeated myself. Look it is obvious that, if I may be blunt, you lack any real proper training besides the usual strength training and cardio workouts. And, a lack of a better word, behind the curve compared to rest of us in the whole quirk department. T that's true. It's troubling. He noted grasping his hand a little. I'm still having trouble controlling how much I use at one time. He then blinked a little, come to think of it, there is this one time. Oh, oh, oh. save that for all might. I tells him, he has way more experience than I do. He'll know what to do. He nodded and I continue, what I am proposing is that you could train with me. Huh, W with you. Yeah. I nodded, I know a guy that practices martial arts and has been teaching me for about. I counted a little, about five to six years now. If I ask, he might teach you a few things too. Maybe it can help with regulating you know what, with the whole control the flow of the body energy and all that. Not to mention that my quirk is somewhat similar to it. What do you say? Of course. Martial arts are famous for their controlling the flow of energy in their body, and one for all is somewhat similar. He then starts mumbling non-stop, a sight that I am quite familiar with personally, in this life and the previous one. Got to say, it's kind of weird and endearing at the same time. H-A-H-A-H-A. A loud boisterous voice can be heard, knocking Midori out of his trance as loud footsteps stomp up the stairs before All Might slides in front of us with a proud pose. Midori is shouting. Is here. Just a quick question. I pointed out with a raised eyebrow, why do you always do that? The poses and the catchphrase, I mean, this ain't Jojo. Then the image of All Might doing such a pose, more especially the Jonathan Joestar pose, pops into my head, forcing me to push my hand against my mouth before I became a loud cackle of laughter, on on see second though thoughts, you do why 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 you. Ooh okay, I can hear All Might's eyebrow raising in response. Do you need something, All Might? Midoriya asked. Ah, uh, yes, I want to ask if you'll. 
He then raises his tied lunchbox in a rather feminine manner with his hands raised to his chest with one holding onto the lunchbox. Have lunch with me. PFFTT. I almost burst out laughing from that phrase alone. Add the whole girly posture and it made for quite a ridiculous scene that I never thought I have the pleasure of seeing. Oh, yes sure. He nodded before turning to me, um, Tatsuya-san. About the, I lift my hand up to stop him from talking as I gather my breath into order before turning to him, don't worry. You don't have to accept right away. Just try to tell me the answer by the end of school, okay. Oh okay. He nods before following All Might down the stairs. Well, yes I'll go for lunch. Hey, Jenko, saved you a spot. Teku calls out to me from our table. With him is our usual group of friends with the small exception of Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu for some reason. Although the chanting of people at another table with the two turfs of spiky hairs of red and silver is suggesting something, all sitting down and halfway finishing their lunch. However, someone else is with them this time. Hey there. Shinsu waved at me in his usual deadpan expression. Shinsu. I stated in surprise. My purple-haired friend is sitting at the table munching away at his omelet rice. I didn't expect to find you here. He came to us, actually. Su tells me. He's a pretty nice guy. Pony stated with a smile, if a bit quiet. I looked at him a raised eyebrow. He replies with his own in a shrug. Now that I think about, I should have recognized Shinsu the moment I met him. He is a fan favorite for a lot of people, and his appearance is rather distinct and obvious. Damn me and my lack of remembering plot. What about you? Teku asks me, you're usually very early. I have some matters to take care of. I tells him as I sat down on the table, nothing much. Speaking of which, what are your guys' plans for the sports festival? Shinsu asks us, it must be a really big deal for you people from the hero course. You have to remind me of that. Teku groans in agony as he lands his face in his hand. I was looking forward to Golden Week, too. Oh yeah, it happens on the tail end of Golden Week. I pointed out as I took a bite of my tempera prawn, at least we'll have the most of it to prep for the festival. I swallowed my bite, well, I'll probably be jogging every morning and evening, maybe practice a few forms before breakfast. Wanna meet up to train, then? My sleepy-eyed friend asked, it's been a while since we actually spar with each other. Sure, if I am able. I nodded before turning to my childhood friend, what about you, Teku? Wanna join us? I guess. How about you guys? I asked Suyu and Pony. Thanks for the offer, but I have my own training schedule to work on, Kiro. The frog girl stated, same here. The American nodded, but maybe next time. Sure, slam. My attention turns to the table I passed by before, where the crowd suddenly cheers as a hardened arm of Kirishima is raised up with a victory cry. So, I pointed at them with a raised eyebrow. Kirishima wants to see whose quirk is the better one and Tetsu Tetsu likes a good challenge. Teku explains, guess we know the answer now. Boys will be boys. Suu commented, me and Pony nodding in agreement. Now remember, you all only have two weeks to train and prepare for the sports festival. Dad tells us with we all gathered at the track field in our gym uniforms, so I don't want to see anyone slacking off today, understand? Yes, sir. Due to the upcoming sports festival, all afternoon classes are to be on hold from tomorrow onwards, as a way to let us have enough time to train for it. Got to admit, it would free up my schedule quite a bit and allow me time to practice my forms after school. Got to ask Shinsu if his classes are the same, that way we can link up for practice. With self-improvement being the goal here, we all disperse into our selective groups while some just went solo like Bakugou and Todoroki. I decide to head for the tracks to practice my running, my speed back in USJ is really lacking so I want to improve on my time. And I need to find some way to charge up my quirk without relying on a source of electricity. Wonder what else have a charge of electricity. Hey, Tetsuya-san. Just as I was about to start my lap, Midoriya runs up to me, I want to talk to you about. You know, oh, sure, want to go somewhere. Oh, and no, it's cool, it's and nothing that's serious. He assures me with a sort of panicking waving of his arms, it's about your offer. My eyebrows raise a little at that as he continues, I've talked with All Might, and he thinks that is a good idea as well. Although I would need to keep to my usual training routine, and maybe. I let out a small giggle at the start of his mumbling, so. Ah, uh, I, I mean, I would like to accept your offer, to train with you. I see, I nodded with a smile, that's good to hear. At least now, he will have a much better chance dealing with the plot. With hope, he might handle muscular without breaking his arms. I sure hope Buto will be around. It's better if a master practitioner teaches him instead of a couple of amateurs. But I guess sparring with us could work as it is. What is your address? Huh, oh oh, it's... With this, my plan to alter the plot begins. To be continued. I'll make... 50 minutes. Yeah, my time limit is getting shorter by the day. Yagi Tashinori tells his student as he pours him a cup of tea, I can barely maintain my muscle form for an hour now. It's that bad. Izuku mutters to himself worriedly, sorry. The symbol of peace inwardly chuckles at his reply. He always knew that the young man is similar to him in many ways. Ambitions, determination, that drive to save others, even his personality in some ways. It's like looking into a mirror. Don't apologize. We're so alike, you and I. He laughed. I wanted to talk to you about a few things, is all. Oh, okay. Well, first thing first. 
Tetsuya Shoujo, mentioning her brought a slight flinch in his student to his grim realization. I take it that she has sought you out about one for all. And no, she didn't at all. Izuku tells him. Actually, she said that she wouldn't say anything to anyone. In fact, she wants to help me. Help you? Yeah. She knows that I couldn't regulate one for all properly and wanted to help me with it. He then turns to his master and adding on, Speaking of that, I wanted to tell you something about that. There was one time which there was no kickback when I used it. Ah, I think I remember you mentioning that before. He stated, Was there anything different about that time? Different? The only difference is, the future number one hero thought for a moment, and then came to a realization, I've used it on. That black villain. Dinamu. Tashinori wonders about that. That beast of a man isn't exactly a normal person, with its multiple quirks and lack of a mind. If that is the case, it might be due to its shock absorption quirk taking the full impact of your punch, absorbing the recoil with it. Ah, uh, that may be. It did feel like I was punching a cushion. He then came to a grim realization. I guess that means that I've made no improvements, after all. It may seem so, but, the teacher thinks for a moment, maybe you need a better visualization than the egg. Something to help you visualizing it. You could ask your classmates for help, if you can. Now that you mention it, Tetsuya-san said that she knows someone that could teach me martial arts to help regulate one for all. He stated, and also stated that her quirk is similar to one for all as well. Similar. If he remembers class 1A student profiles that he has reread over and over again in the months leading to the start of the semester, her quirk is described as absorbing electricity and using it to accelerate her reflexes. In a sense, it is similar to one for all. Oh my goodness. All might. Midoriya Shounen. I fear that Tetsuya Shoujo might have a better understanding of one for all than me. Chapter 13, Before the Sports Festival As the sun slowly set down in the evening sky, I slow down my jogging pace as I turn my attention towards the street. I then took in a couple of deep breaths before reaching into my pocket and pulls out a button battery. And then, I close my hand around it as I feel the charge filling my body. Ready. I call out as I prepare to sprint forward. Okay. Shinsu's voice calls out in the distance, on your marks. Go. I push my foot back and rockets down the street. The surrounding blurs as I try to force my quirk to push my body faster and faster. Soon enough, everything besides in front of me became somewhat of a tunnel vision as everything else just faded into splashes of color as I felt myself going way faster than I previously could. A purple blur passes on my right and I immediately pull the brakes, digging my heel and pressing my sole on the pavement hard as I actually hear the infamous skidding sound of braking race cars coming from my shoe soles. After slowing down to a halt, I jog back to my middle school friend letting out a few pants. How was it? H.M. You actually doubled your previous record. He pointed out, showing my speed on the speedometer to be 210 miles per hour. Wow, that's crazy. I didn't think I would improve this much. That's nuts. I look at my hands as I clench them into tight fists. Guess those speed practices after school have really paid off. You'll definitely get some top hero's attention now. I don't think anyone in the first year has your level of speed, except maybe that glasses class president of yours. Yeah, it is pretty fast. G.U.K. We turn to the sound of groaning as Teku stopped his kicks to help Midoriya get back on his feet. You really need to stop thinking too hard. He tells him, that just slows you down. Got to make quick and fast decisions, not think out the entire scenario. All right. The inheritor of the symbol of peace got into a loose stance that feels more street fight than an actual proper stance as he got right back into sparring. As I watch him weave in and out to avoid my childhood friend's fast kicks, it brought up the thought of how much improvement he has made over the past couple of weeks. In the past week leading to Golden Week, I managed to synchronize my schedule with Midoriya's as well as Teku's and Shinsu's to set up this practice session. Sadly, I later found out that Budo won't be free to help teach my green-haired friend, he mentioning about getting placed in charge of one heck of a case. Due to that, we're left with no other choice and try to teach him the best we can and moved our training sessions from Teku's apartment complex to training ground beta. The training grounds around campus have been opened up for the upcoming sports festival, which allow all of us to train our quirks as much as we like. But it is only open until 7 p.m., which leaves us not much time to practice especially after school, at least until Golden Week starts anyway. But despite all that and having a shaky start at first, Midoriya picks up on things very quickly. The only thing we have done with him is sparring. Besides we helping him with his form here and there and showing him a more effective way of punching forward than his usual telephone punches, it was sparring match after sparring match between the four of us. And the improvement does show, with him managing to get in a few good hits on us with there being this one time that he manages to get a good hit on Teku's nose which he later apologized profusely afterwards. He's starting to shape up as a proper fighter now. As for Midoriya's control over one for all, full cow. I am brought out of my thoughts as I saw my green-haired classmate clenching his fists while he stood in a power-up stance that came right out of Dragon Ball. His body starts to glow as green lightning crackles across his entire body with his emerald eyes starts to shine in a similar fashion to All Might's. Yup, as it turns out, he figured it out pretty quickly as soon as I gave him a hint. Flashback. I feel like you're using one for all incorrectly. I pointed out as we are walking towards the station together after our first session. 
Taiko has to head back first as it was his turn to buy the groceries and Shinsu mentioned that he has something to do and left before any of us. Incorrectly, he asked me, what do you mean? I raise my hand as if to flick the air. When you use it, you are calling on it like it's a separate entity, right? Why yeah, hi it's exactly like that. How do you know? Um, crap, I didn't think this through. Let's see, let's see. How to make it so that it doesn't. Ah, uh, bingo. Why your reaction time? Whenever you use your quirk, it looks like you are really concentrating hard on it. Oh, is that so? Why yeah. I let out a small sigh in relief. That was close, nearly blow my own cover there. The first step in my plan to alter the plot is for Midoriya to gain full cowl early, so to get him more prep up for the sports festival in order to help build him in preparation of the bigger threats later down the road, like Stain for example. If he can get a better understanding of one for all before the whole job experience training, then Gran Torino might have a better time training him and getting him stronger than his canon counterpart. With enough time and luck, he might get enough strength to deal with Muscular without resorting to suicide attacks. Although, asking him to take on the likes of Muscular who is basically a low-tier Hulk-like villain is a bit out there. But in order to do that, he must find out about it on his own. There's no point if I tell him how it works on the get-go. So, here I am, trying to throw hints at him and hope he figures it out. But anyways, to use it like that isn't how quirks usually function. That could be why you are having quite a lot of trouble with it. What do you mean? He asked. Quirks are, like a muscle, they are a part of your body. I explain, you don't usually have to concentrate on your legs to walk, right? Same with quirks. You can't think on how to use it, you just use it. I, don't really follow. Okay, let's use my quirk as an example. I pointed at myself and continues to explain, if you remember, whenever I absorb electricity, the energy absorbed is circulating around my body in a continuous circuit. And whenever I choose to use that power, I didn't think about using it, I just run and used it. My quirk automatically uses it for me. Ah, uh, like winding up a toy. He pointed out, you are basically winding yourself up by absorbing electricity. And then after that, you just let go and it runs dot 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 on dot 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 it's dot 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 on dot dot dot. I look back at him as Midoriya just stopped walking and stood there with his eyes wide open as if something just became clear, is something wrong? I, I get it now. I finally understand. H huh, get what? You are right, I've been using one for all incorrectly this whole time. He stated with a smile, all this time, the image in my mind is that I have turned on a switch in my mind to activate it, a switch on my arms and legs to let the energy flow through. But that's not right at all. Instead of letting it just flow through, he clenches his fists tightly, I should have just let it flood my entire body in. Whoa, whoa, hold it. I immediately stop him and grab his shoulders firmly, I'm glad you figure things out, but let's not get ahead of ourselves there. The last thing we need is for you to blow yourself up just to test it. Why yeah, you're right, too bad Aizawa sensei is still at the hospital. A recovery girl would still be around, so at least she should be able to heal any fractures, right? The very next day after school, he did exactly that and with as much luck he can get as the main character, he just barely managed to get full cow working with no major repercussion. From what he said, it was about 3% of one for all's full potential power, a full 2% lesser than his cannon's first time cowling. But beggars can't be choosers so it's good enough right now. Right off the bat, the difference is truly shown. He was able to keep up with my speed, even though mostly it's just him just trailing close behind me, and his punches does get an extra oomph to them when we sparred a second time. Full cow became his go-to mode from then on, him using it every time we got into a spar. Although it did little to nothing to help him in the spar as most of us still keep knocking off his feet in the first few seconds. My attention is then brought back to the sparring match when Midoriya manages to get in close to Teku and strikes out a straight punch at him. My childhood friend reacting by igniting his feet and somersaulting over him with small embers trickling behind him. The moment he is behind him, his left leg burns brighter as he launches a back kick into his opponent's back, sending him tumbling onto the ground. That was great. Teku stated with a thumbs up, you nearly got me back there. You've really improved. That was amazing too, Naru-san. Midoriya tells him with a smile, I didn't know your quirk could let you fly. Well, not really. He pointed out, it's more of jettisoning me up. I could create lift, but only at the direction opposite of where I'm blasting my flames at. But it still means you can fly, right? I, guess, okay, okay, enough with how Teku's quirk works. I tell them as both me and Shinsu walks up to them, you guys done with sparring. Pretty much. Teku stated as he stretches out his legs, if anything, when there's a fighting portion, we'll be well prepared. And there always will be. Midoriya stated, every year, the sports festival always have ended with a large-scale tournament of some kind, usually one that involves combat of some kind. It is the biggest portion of the sports festival. Didn't you watch the sport festival last year, Teku? Shinsu asked. I did, most of it, anyways. My childhood friend stated, that time, I was tasked with buying snacks so I only managed to watch the last match. His entire apartment has a large viewing party for it every year. I explained to Midoriya, who nodded in understanding. Either way, I think we're fully prepared for whatever the sports festival is going to throw at us. Teku grins clenching his fist, and a lot more. He then turns to Shinsu, you better put up your game, Shinsu. Because I'll be aiming to win this whole thing. Glad to. 
He nodded with a smile of his own, no way I'll passing this opportunity away. I'm going to get into the heroics department at all costs. And what am I? Chopped liver. I asked teasingly, because there's no way any of you guys are going to keep up with me. Dream on. Oh, I'll find a way. We all shared a glance at each other before we each let out a small chuckle at our declaration. The sports festival, regardless of the plot or not, is one of the largest events that I'll ever has the chance to be part of, and the biggest opportunity for me to become a top-tier hero in the same aspect as my father. It's only one in three chances, so I have to really impress the top brass in this. If that means I have to beat Teku and Shinsu here, then I'll gladly do so. After all, they'll do the same if it were me. What's wrong, Midoriya? Teku's words brought me back out of my thoughts when he asked my classmate that. Oh, I it's nothing. He nervously laughed, it's just, I'm kind of envious of your friendship. Why, don't you have friends too? He asked him. Yeah, but never like what you guys have. He stated, you and Tatsuya-san, it's kind of what I want things to be with Kaken. All right. He and Bakugou are childhood friends too. But unlike me and Teku, they are more of a bully and his victim than friends. Yes, seeing me and Teku is kind of difficult for him. Kaken. You mean that blonde prodigy student? Bakugou Katsuki. Shinsu pointed out, I think I saw him around a few times, but he just scoffs me off whenever our eyes meet, it really grinds on my gears. I'll say. Teku grumbles. I get that he is the top student of our year, but his personality is so full of shit that it made the position pretty much invalid. Not to mention that most of the points he got in the entrance exam he got from Kill Steely Mine. Wait, he was in the same exam site as you. I asked in surprise. Talk about a small world. Yeah, and he is a huge dick about it, too. His explosions keep creating smoke clouds so we can't see much, not to mention that he keeps on taking most of the three-pointers for himself which left the rest of us salvaging for points with the one-pointers. And if that wasn't enough, the aftermath of his explosions nearly hurt a lot of people if I didn't manage to save them in time. Talk about rude. Man, and I thought I've got it rough. Shinsu points out. But in the sports festival, things are going to different. He grins as he slams his fist in his open palm, there's no way I'm letting him just win. Even if I'm not going to get first, I'm going to make sure he doesn't. You have quite a grudge with him, huh? Damn right, I do. I let out a small sheepish chuckle at his ranting on the reasons he hates the blonde teen as I recall the largest event that would change the world forever, which is all centered around that blonde dickhead. Oh boy, hopefully my plans for it will hold tight. Days all flew by and soon enough, it was the day of the sports festival. Is everyone good and ready? Hate his shout echoes in our chatty prep room, the event is about to start. Are you nervous, Jenko-chan? Suyu asked me as she hands me a water bottle. A little. I chuckles as I finish my stretches, never been much of a crowd person myself. Midoriya. As I took a sip, my attention along with the rest of the class all turned to our second prodigy student, not just the one he called. Todoroki-san. Midoriya asked curiously, what is it? Objectively speaking, I'm stronger than you, more capable. H huh. W well, sure. All Might got his eye on you, doesn't he? He stiffened at that comment, I'm trying to not to flinch to that as well, now I'm not about to pry into why that's the case, but regardless. I will beat you. For a moment, the entire room is silenced by his declaration of war against Midoriya, me included. If I recall correctly, his backstory is that his father, Endeavour, basically raised him with the sole purpose of using him to surpass All Might, which translates to a very rough childhood. That scar on his left eye, if my memory is correct, is caused by his mother going somewhat insane and pouring hot water on his face which landed her in a mental hospital. Now that I think about it, the sports festival is quite focused on him and Midoriya. And in the end, H. Hey, man. Kirishima walks up to him and placing a hand on his shoulder, why pick a fight now? We're about to go on. Todoroki just shrugs his hand off and adds on coldly, I really don't care. I'm not pretending to be anyone's friend here. Well, yeah, but... Todoroki, I'm not sure why. You felt the need to tell me you'll beat me. Midoriya states out, you're clearly stronger. And I can't truly measure up to most of the others here in skill. See, come on, Midoriya. The red-haired teen tells him, don't put yourself down. But even so, he abruptly interrupts him as he adds on, everyone else. Even the kids from the other course are aiming for the top. And I, well, let me say this. I'm not going to fall behind. I'm going for it too, with everything I've got. Fine by me. He stated as calm as he always is. Okay, everyone, form up. Edda suddenly shouts, if we take any longer, we are going to late for the ceremony. Todoroki is the first to head out the door, with the rest of us following suit as I drain my bottle and check my gym pants pockets for my stash of button batteries. When Midoriya walks past me, I put my hand on his shoulder and whispered, good luck. Why yeah, why you too? With that, we all head out of the room. The sports festival is about to begin. To be continued. Chapter 14, Sports Festival, Part 1. I let out a small nervous breath as I huddled together with my class near the entrance of the stadium. The echoes of the cheering crowd bounced around the corridor where we are waiting for our queue to enter, the vibrations of their screams passing through my skin. This is it. It is now or never. And first up, that's the queue. Hida informs us as he and Yeirazu leads us onwards towards the light at the end of the tunnel. The cheering and music got louder with each step took, with it my anxiousness rises as well. 
I can feel my hands shaking with anticipation as we took the last few steps before entering into the light. You know who I'm talking about. The miraculous rising stars who brushed off a villain attack with their steely willpower. The first years of the hero course. Ayyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyy
things just got a whole lot harder. Racers, to your positions. Everyone crowds around the starting gate as one of the lights on it lights up, indicating the countdown for us. I immediately reach into my pockets for a battery before noticing that Kaminari is right in front of me. Getting an idea that won't deplete my battery loadout, I carefully and quietly reach out and claps my hand on his shoulder. T. Tetsuya, sharing is caring. I feel the charge filling in as the second light lights up. I immediately remove my hand when I have a complete charge before the third light signs off. Start. The moment the siren signs off, I rocket through the entrance gate and down the tunnel, Ida and Midoriya close behind me but a tad bit too slow to be any of a real threat. We barely made it out of onto the actual track before the corridor became, as predicted, a retelling of what I like to refer as the false danger alarm incident. See ya. I laughed as I shoots down the track at my top speed, leaving my other speedster buddies in the dust. Good thing there aren't small turns at this part of the track, so I can go full speed without worrying too much. I've got this race in the bag. You're not the only one with an advantage in this. I look back to see Taiko leaping over Ada before I saw him kick the air and rockets towards me. Damn it, forgot about him. But still, I thought you have trouble with it before. I asked as he speeds up next to me. Practiced when you weren't looking. He pointed out, we all got to have trump cards of our own, you know. Well, no way I'm letting that beat me. I then rushes forward as fast as I can muster, barely scrapping beyond my current top speed. A quick glance back to see that Teku is close behind, he picking up speed with every kick. Nella, this is my turf now. It doesn't matter how much you imitate Sanji's skywalk, there's no way I'm letting you get past me. Ready for our live commentary, mummy man. Not voluntarily, no. I nearly trip over myself when I heard present Mike's and Aizawa's voice over the speakers. The hell, wasn't he supposed to be hospitalized until next week? What's he doing here? Got to say, I'm surprised that recovery girl let you come here. As long as I'm staying up here till the end of the festival. I still think she's overreacting a little. Ah, that explains a lot. I'm going on ahead. I heard Teku laugh as I turned to see him shooting past and overtaking my lead. He did not just what I think he just did. No way you're getting ahead of me. I stated in mock anger as I pick up as much as speed as possible down the road. No way I'm letting him take the lead. My pride is the fastest among us is on the line now. I was able to catch up with Teku before he suddenly turns his body and kicks forward before some assaulting back. Every obstacle course needs obstacles. Present Mike points out suddenly, starting with the first barrier, Robo Inferno. A glimpse of green metal can be seen as he lands on the ground as I skidded to a halt, the corpse of a familiar robot lying before us while a metallic hell awaits beyond. In front of us is a large field filled with the robot villains from the entrance exam, including the Goliath Zero Pointers that Midoriya smashes only there's at least ten of them instead of one, painting quite a scary image. Oh, fuck me, seriously. Teku stated in shock, one of those bastards is bad enough but this is just cruel. But they are slow. I point it out as I run forward, so we can just avoid them. I dash right into the field of robots. The first zero pointer slams its hand towards me, only for me to just move a bit to the right to slip right through the gaps between its robotic fingers. I then jump on its arm and run across it up till its shoulder. I slam my hand on the wires on its neck for a quick recharge before sliding down its back and taking a running leap off it, and dive rolling on near the end of the field. Thank you, inertia. Shoulders and back hurt like a bitch, though. One ace Tetsuya takes the lead by clearing that obstacle in record time. Damn, her quirk is basically cheating at this point. That's so unfair. I let out a laugh at the commentary as I dodge a few robots before rocketing down the track towards the next obstacle. Unfair or not, there's no stopping this girl. Teku is left stunned by how easy his childhood friend made it look as she sprints down the path beyond the obstacle. He knows that she is fast, but to be this agile too. Then again, there are times where she basically park her across the school when she was chasing that cat back in middle school. She got into trouble so many times. And away she goes. He mumbles to himself as he hears the other students coming closer by the minute, before taking a deep breath and let loose a grin on his face. Well, no way I'm getting left behind in the dust. He then ignites his feet, he wearing the special shoes from his hero costume that would not burn off, and leaps high into the air. A few more kicks for altitude and he successfully climb over the zero pointer in front of him. He then adjusts himself midair by unleashing small bursts of flame from his ankles so that he would be angled slightly downwards and kicks hard. That sends him flying down towards the ground, heading straight for the exit. And following behind is one bee's Naru, taking the high road as well. Didn't know flaming feet meant flight. Then crackling of ice can be heard in the distance as the zero pointer he just climbed over is frozen from the ground, which proceeds to topple over and crashing into the ground hard. And just in time too, as one ace Todoroki took care of it while dealing with his opponents. Talk about harsh, ice cold, even. Is the second part really necessary? Teku took a quick glance to check the commotion, before kicking again to speed up. Time to catch up. Sorry, Jenko, but I'm planning on winning this one. I speed down the track, the slight curve not much of a challenge for me despite me needing to slow down so not to go off course. Based on what commentary present Mike has been shouting over the past few minutes, Teku must be hot on my tails and probably catching up soon. With Todoroki not too far behind along with majority of my classmates, including Midoriya who is surprisingly not far behind of Bakugu, 
Got to say, not expecting Teku to go Sanji on me, with flaming feet and everything. All he needs now is to dye his hair blonde, don a black suit and somehow create a swirl around on his eyebrows. A chuckle escapes my mouth when the image of Teku as Sanji pops into my head. I highly doubt he would wear a business suit though. When I came and climbs a line of stairs leading upwards, it prompts me to remember what the second obstacle is supposed to be. If I remember correctly, it's a tightrope thing, right? With a very long fall, oh shit. I quickly skid to a stop when I saw the sudden intense drop in front of me. The first barrier may have been too easy, but what about the second? Present Mike stated, fall and you're out. You got to crawl across if you want to make it. This is the fall. He was right about one thing, if the too self-explanatory game isn't enough. In front of me basically an enormous pit with large stone pillars of various sizes placed in random that are connected by countless of different tightropes that just be looking at it. Form a secondary obstacle of being a semi-maze of routes to traverse on. Geez, what happens if you did fall into the pit? I highly doubt there are any real casualties in this school, but falling from this height would result in a broken bone or two. Or three. Four, if you are unluckily enough. Shaking myself out of my thoughts, I quickly survey the obstacle in front of me while I took out a battery from my pocket for another recharge. Let's see. From this tightrope in front of me, the shortest route will be. My turn to shine. I am again brought out of my thoughts when Teku passed me in a burning blaze as I saw him literally flying over the entire thing with much ease. Oh right, what's the point of crossing tightropes when you can fly? Oh my, the lead has finally changed. Looks like Tetsuya's quirk isn't the only one that is unfair in this situation. See you at the finish line. He calls back as he landed on the end and runs ahead. Ha, huh, he didn't use his flames that time. He must have overheated his quirk right now. But that doesn't really matter if the gap between us this far. As if. I let out a small growl as I quickly step on the tight rope and run down the thing as fast as I am able without tripping. While not as sturdy as the metal fencing on my old middle school's roof, it's still not enough to deter me. Just you wait. I'll get the lead back for sure. When I'm about to cross my third tightrope, crackle of ice can be heard from behind as the tightrope next to me is crossed by Todoroki, who is basically skating on it by freezing it as he goes. Damn it, him too. I quickly speed up and cross the tightrope as fast as possible, navigating across the various tightropes with not much difficulty due to picking the shortest and fastest route available to me, all the while keeping Todoroki from overtaking me. The moment I crossed the second last tightrope, I saw Bakugou catching up from behind by doing the same thing as Teku by propelling himself through the air with his explosions. Nope, not letting him pass me. Noting the distance between the pillar I'm on and the end, I quickly took a running start and leap across the gap and nails a three-point landing just as Todoroki skates up right next to me with the explosion team close behind. Taking no chances with the son of Endeavor, I quickly rockets forward after Teku, just as I heard the crackling of ice coming towards me and nearly touching my heels. That was close. If I'd been a second too late, I would have had been trapped in ice. That was a close one. Todoroki attempts to freeze Tetsuya in place has failed, and now she is speeding towards the third and final barrier. As I ran, I grab another battery from my pocket and took another recharge. Maybe I should have brought the higher voltage ones. I'm running through my loadout very quickly. The leads keep breaking ahead, while the rest of the pack are all bunched up together. Our racers don't know how many will get to move on, so all they can do is aim for first place. It should be a sizable amount, if I remember correctly. But as long you are within the first ten, it should be a guarantee in. Come to think of it, wasn't there some kind of special condition for the one that came in first? What was it again? It's on the tip of my tongue too. And now... Our leader at the moment has reached the final barrier. That is to say, boom, damn it. I skid to a stop as Teku comes tumbling towards me, rolling to a stop next to me. The minefield. It's a deadly Afghan carpet. A quick glance is enough to reveal the mine's locations, so keep both eyes open and watch your step. Present Mike then adds on, I should mention that our mines won't pack a deadly punch, but they are loud and flashy, enough that you might need a change of underwear when it's over. Depending on the individual, of course. Well, considering what just happened, I mutter to myself while looking at the bright pink cloud of smoke rising from where the first mine has detonated. The entire minefield stretches across a good few yards, where the entrance back into the stadium can be seen up ahead. The bulges of the mines themselves are visible enough to see with a simple glance, but the distance between said mines are only big enough for at least a single foot. Talk about the world's loudest and flashiest game of hopscotch. Oh, oh. Teku got back on his feet and ignites his feet for a moment, before extinguishing them a second later, damn it, any more and I'll get burns. Well, tough luck for you. I stated with a smile, but not for me. I immediately dashes in, still at full charge as I hops between the spaces of the mines as fast as I can. And Tetsuya takes the lead once again. This is easy. With Teku out of commission, the rest of the race will be a breeze. Not this time. The moment I land safely on another safe space, crackling of ice can be heard and my feet is instantly encased in an ice cocoon that reach up past my ankles. Thankfully, only one of my feet is trapped but unfortunately, I'm in a bad position since my body is angled slightly backwards from landing. That causes me to lean back rather awkwardly and almost made me fall if I didn't stabilize my footing with my free foot. 
Oh, but that quickly changes. Todoroki finally ices her and took the lead. Talk about bad timing. Oh, come the fuck on. I shouted as I pulls on my feet to try and free it all the while the red and white-haired teen jogs past me. Huh, this crap can't slow me down. Then Bakugou blasts past from behind right up to Todoroki. Hey, you. You made the wrong declaration of war to the wrong person, half and half. And one A's Bakugou comes rocketing in from behind. Look alive, mass media. Looks like we're going to have a struggle in our hands. I let out a groan at the fact that I let Bakugou, Bakugou of all people, overtake me. This is just great. Like I didn't have enough problems already. No way I'm letting that bastard get first place. Teku suddenly shouted as he run past me on the frozen soil around me, before igniting his feet and kicking into the air once again, thanks for the ice. My feet has finally cooled down enough to let me do this again. He then kicks forward and gets into the struggle as well. Now another joins the fray. Why, even the rest of the bunch are now catching up. True to his words, the rest of the group is slowly coming up on the minefields, some already making a great attempt to cross it. With those three grabbling for first, can they hold on to their lead? Not if I have anything to say about that. I mumbles out as I pull on my feet again, but to no effect. What do I do? I don't have any fire abilities so I can't melt it, and my power only affect my speed so I can't just break out of it. Not good, if this keeps up, they'll get past me. What do I? I then remember my powers in a certain fictional superhero and I face bombed. I'm such an idiot. If it works with the flash, I grab another battery from my pocket and starts to absorb the charge. As I did that, the focus on my legs and tries to shaking it. Soon enough, my frozen feet became a blur from the vibration and the ice around it slowly but surely broke away, freeing me from the frozen cocoon. So, that's how it feels. I mutter before getting my bearings straight and dashes right after them, all the while avoiding the mines which slowed me down a bit but not enough. And now Tatsuya is now catching up too. Looks like it's going to be a four-way struggle for the lead. I pick up the pace as I tries to circumvent the whole three-way brawl. Struggle in front of me, me fighting any of them with their quirks is just going to waste time so I'll rather let them fight it out while I get first place. Sorry, Teku, but I'll be going on ahead. Oh, it's so close. Who is going to pass through that final gate first? But just as I'm about to reach close to overtake the three of them. Boom. A massive shockwave suddenly erupted from behind us. I look back to see a giant cloud of pink smoke that indicates the detonation of several landmines at once. A giant explosion near the entrance. Why was the bang so big? Was it his plan or sheer coincidence? And then out of that pink smoke flew out a green metal plate that looks like it is tore out of the robots from the first obstacle. When I saw who was on said metal plate, I quickly realized what just happened. Midoriya. And one A's Midoriya mounts his charge. And wow did he do that with a bang. The successor of All Might flew past all of us, scraping past Bakugou's head in the process and taking the lead in one explosive move. What a guy. And he overtook them all. He overtook them. D.K.U. Bakugou shouted angrily as he blasts right towards him, Don't you dare go ahead of me. This isn't the time to worry about those behind me. Todoroki mutters out as he freezes the ground in front of him, forming a pathway. Good going, Midoriya. Teku calls out as he kicks and propels himself forward, but I'm not letting you overtake me without a fight. I let my surprise die down before quickly chases after him. Main character or not, I'm not letting anyone take the lead that easily. It's not over yet, Midoriya. The four who were formerly in the lead stopped tripping each other up and begun to bolt after Midoriya. They say it takes a common enemy to put a hold on strife. The strife will never disappear, right? What in blazes are you even talking about? We all start to go past Midoriya's supposed landing point as he starts to stall in the air, me just barely outpacing the three of them. But then, while he was in midair, the green-haired teen pulls on the wire cord from the metal plate and slams right into the ground next to us. A bunch of clicks later, and an enormous explosion blinds and pushes all of us out of the way while it carries Midoriya, now glowing in full cowl, forward and through the final gate. In no time at all, Midoriya blew dust in their eyes. And now that he has cleared the landmine area entirely. Damn, Eraserhead. Your class is insane. Why are you teaching them? I didn't do anything. This is all the fruit of the fires they all lit in each other. I quickly regain my bearings and dashes right through the smoke, using the last bit of my charge to accelerate myself as much as I could to catch up. No time to recharge. Got to bank on the last slitter of energy I got. I can hear explosions from behind me as well as the crackling of ice coming closer. I ignore all of that and dashes straight on, entering the corridor with the light of Midoriya's full cowl shining in front of me. But despite me struggling to get back the lead, it is obvious who placed first in the end. And what a surprising turn of events. Who could have predicted this outcome? The man who has returned to the stadium in triumph, with the most flashiest of all entrances in the history of the sports festival, is none other than M-I-D-O-R-I-Y-A-I-Z-U-K-U. I barely made it second as Teku blasts right next to me the moment I pass the gate which is then followed by Bakugou, who has a small bruise on his nose that may or may not have been from my dear childhood friend, and Todoroki skating in it about the same time and is currently steaming, most likely due to him heating up and thawing away the ice. Damn it. Not again. Fucking shit. I can hear the explosive teen mumbling out curses one after another as the other students all made it to the finishing line. 
I think I saw Tsuyu among the few that made it a few minutes after us, along with several of our classmates with a good portion of them making in quite early. And the racers all come in one after the other. We'll compile the results later, so for the time being enjoy your breather. When he says it like that, it just screams ominous foreshadowing. I point out to my childhood friend, who is sitting on the floor with his legs spread out to catch his breath, and to relax his legs which looks rather reddish. Well, present my, Mike does, have the thing, for, the doctor, dramatic, he pants out, also, thanks for, showing, off, you're in, insane star, stamina, jerk, when you have a quirk like mine, I start to point out, before noticing Shinsu running and while panting rather heavily, hey, Shinsu, he notices me and tiredly jogs up to us, hey, guys, he panted out, damn, you guys are, fast, but without, the damn, stamina, to be fair, you were fighting with Bakugou and Todoroki back there, that drains stamina very quickly, I then point the still cursing blonde delinquent, also, did you kick him in the face, his thumbs up is all I need to know, guess he took advantage of the situation, that being said, how did you do, pretty hopeful, all things considered, Shinsu let out a loud sigh, maybe in the top 20, let's not, get to hopeful now, Teku panted out, we just have to wait and see, I guess. So, Midnight calls out after a few minutes are spent with us taking a good breather from the intense race and are now gathered around the stage again, the race is all over. Now everyone, please take a look at the results. A hologram screen blitz into life behind her, showing us the entire results for the race in its entirety. Besides the obvious, I quickly note that I'm second, due to being so close behind of Midoriya near the end there, while Teku got third. After that is Todoroki followed by Bakugu, who is pretty pissed at the whole thing much to my childhood friend's glee. I think he is getting off to this a bit too much. Then again, so am I, to an extent. Hey, look where Shinsu is placed. Following my friend's advice, I scroll down the list, while getting surprised at Ida getting 8th despite his quirk, and took note of Shinsu's position. To my glee, he managed to place himself behind Mina at 20th place. Yes, his assumption is correct, and this means that he has a good chance of getting into the next stage. Alright, Shinsu. Alright, as much as it pains to say this. Midnight tells us but a slight blush on her cheek says otherwise to my dismay, but only the top 42 will be advancing into the next round. I'm sorry for those who failed, but take heart. This festival showstopper is still being prepared. And now for the post-preliminaries, the final selection. From here on out, even the press corps will team in a white heat of excitement, so go all out. That just, sounds so wrong when she says it. Teku pointed out. You have no idea. I groaned. Damn it, Nimuri ni. Can you not go into heat over every little thing? Now then, on to today's heart-pounding second event. The hologram starts to start the slot machine UI from the first, it even shows up spinning already. I already know what it will be, but the suspense is killing me. Oh, what could it be? Well, I'll tell you. Behold, the slot machine stops in the panel showing. Cavalry race. I think for a moment as I tries to remember the finer deals of this part. If my memory is correct, it's more or less a team battle in which everyone steals the bandana of the rider of each team. The trick is that everyone will be given a point based on their positions in the race, with the exception of the first place which is, oh dear. However, Midnight suddenly remarks, her explanation of the game went over my head when I was deep in thought, there's an exception, with whomever in first place will receive a grand total of 10 million points. I can already feel the gazes of the other students all burning into Midoriya's head. He is not going to like this part of the festival at all. To be continued, I'll make, all right, Teku. Kimuri shouted to his television screen while the other tenants all cheered, getting fucking third place. That's my boy. Never thought I'll see the day I'll be cheering for either one of those rascals on live TV. One of the tenants shouted, another toast for our champion brats. Kenpai, are you guys seriously drinking right now? Another of the tenants, a young woman stated angrily, it's not even noon yet. On the other side of the globe, on a certain floating island, Tetsujin let out a loud whoop of joy at the monitor in front of him. Way to go, Jen Chan. He cheered happily, that's my little sister out there. Got fucking second place, yeah. We get it, we get it. Just calm down, will you? One of his assistants tells him, it's only the first event. There's still a few more to go. He's really proud of her, ain't he? His mentor, one David Shields noted with a grin, quite a doting brother. I think there's a term for it. Another of his assistants stated, I believe it's. Siskin. What's that mean? His mentor's daughter, a young Melissa Shields asked. It's short for, he didn't get to finish that sentence, thanks no part to a spring boxing glove hitting him in the cheeks. Chapter 15, Sports Festival, Part 2. I could only give him my most sympathies as I tries to ignore the increasing tensions between the students. I am so glad that I didn't finish first. No way I'll be able to handle such pressure. After announcing that supposed death sentence, midnight continues on, the match will last 15 minutes. Each team are determined by its members. The hollow screen behind her then shows the figure of four of our teachers with all might as the rider while present Mike. 13 and Snipe forms the horse under him, the rider will wear a headband displaying the total number of points. Until the match ends, you'll all compete to grab each other's points while maintaining the ones you have. Any headbands you grab must be worn no lower than your neck. 
However, the more headbands you get, the harder they'll be to manage. She warned, and most importantly, even if your headband is taken, or if your horse formation is broken, it's not over until it's over. Damn, that's going to leave room for some pretty innovative moves. I heard someone in the crowd spoke within the countless murmurs popping up left and right, but didn't see who said that. Quirks are allowed, so it'd be a brutal battle. She points out, however, it's still a cavalry battle. Malicious attacking another team with the intent of making them fall will get you a red card. And that means you're out of the game. TCH, so close. I heard Teku speaking in the crowd with a click of his tongue. He really wanted to use this chance to kick back Yugu, huh? You got 15 minutes. Time to form your teams. What? 15 minutes. Except for a few who are mumbling about the short time limit. The rest of us all separate to look for people to team up with. For me, I think I work best as part of the horse. Unlike some of my classmates, mine is best used if speed is necessary. So being the running person is best suited for me. I glance over to Bakugu, who is getting a lot of offers to join up from our classmates, with a few exceptions that are pretty obvious. I also see Midoriya in the crowd, or lack of considering the fact that pretty much everyone is avoiding him like the plague. I don't blame them. As enticing having 10 million points at the start may be, that just puts you at a severe disadvantage once the bandana is stolen. A double-edged sword, if you will. My eyes immediately avoided his when he looks over at me. Sorry Midoriya, but you're not the only one who is planning on winning. Additionally, amongst the crowd is Teku who is around his classmates who seem to be discussing some kind of strategy with the blonde kid, Madama Nito if I remember correctly, acting as the lead strategist of sorts. If I'm not mistaken, in the plot of the manga, anime, Class B used the whole obstacle race as a means to evaluate Class A's abilities and then used that information to attempt to beat us in this match. I guess Teku would be part of that group too. That's a huge bummer. I wanted to ask if we could team up, but guess that's not happening. Hey, Jenko. A voice calls out to me as Shinsu walks up to me, do you want to team up? I stare at him for a moment. He lets out a sigh while rolling his eyes. No, I'm not using my quirk on you right now. Yes, I'm sure. If I don't remember any of this match, I'm blaming you. See, okay, fine. I let out a small laugh at his exasperated expression, just have to make sure. I still remember those blank moments when you made me do stuff that I still have no idea what you did because you guys still won't tell me. It was. Not my finest moments, no. He mumbled with red cheeks, anyways, I wanna ask if you wanna team up with me. Team up. What happened to all that talk yesterday? I asked, didn't you say? I know what I've said. He tells me, but with how this match priorities teamwork over individual competition. I'm willing to swallow my pride and ask for help. True, but why ask me? I mean, there's Midoriya. I'll get mobbed within the first minute if I join up with him. He points out, that, and I think I'll perform better with some familiar faces. But won't that just show the pros that you can't work with people outside your circle of friends? I pointed out, it might affect your opportunity to get into the hero course. Then I'll just have to perform really well in the finals to make up, right? I let out a small sigh as a smile creeps onto my face, alright. I'm in. I take it that you're the rider and I'm the horse. That's the plan. He nodded, then we need two more. If he hasn't joined any other teams. We both look around the crowd for anyone we could ask, just as Teku runs up to us and speak of the devil. You guys forming a team? He asks, mind if I join? That's, came out of left field. I stated, weren't you going to form up with your class? I mean, I saw you guys talking over there and, yeah, but honestly, Monoma can go suck his own dick for all I care. He pointed out, he's a little too into the whole class B versus class a thing that Vlad Sensei came up with during our first week of the semester. I didn't know that was a thing. Shinsu stated, it is, got reprimanded by him for fractalizing with the enemy a few times now. Honestly, I'm hoping to use this match as an excuse to beat him in his own game which means you rather team up with anyone except your own class. I added with a sigh, are you sure that's a good idea? Despite Monoma there, they are still your classmates. I've told them how I feel, and they accepted it. He points out, at least. I think they did. Teku, what's done is done, Jenko. Shinsu tells me, best if we just roll with what we got, which is we are still missing one more person to form our horse. With that said, we took another look around to see if there's anyone still not in a team. I think I saw Tsuyu with Shoji so she's out, and Pony is with her class so she's out too. I then notice amidst the crowd while standing alone with his long muscular tail slumped over his shoulder, looking a bit dejected. He could work. With his tail and Teku's flames add to my speed. Hey, Ajiro-san. Soon enough, 15 minutes are almost up and all of us has formed a team with each other, more or less. Didn't see who Ayama teamed up with, though. I let out a huff as I felt the weight of my friend's shoes on my hands. With the bright and warm morning, nearing noon, sun shining down on the stadium while I feel the tingling feeling of the electricity circulating through me. I've absorbed to my maximum voltage moments ago and has a full charge running. Give or take, it'll last probably through the whole round but I've still has a couple batteries on standby in my pockets just in case. After recruiting Ajiro, although considering that almost no one seems to be keen on teaming up with him, sadly he didn't really have many options. We all discussed and agreed on the formation just before 15 minutes are up. The rider would be Shinsu, with his quirk being a mental one than physical meaning he would serve better as the rider than being part of the horse. That, and the rest of us serve better as being his mount. 
As for the horse part of our formation, we decided on it based on two key knowledge of our team. 1. Ajuru's tail would best function at the back so that's a no-brainer. And 2. Teku's quirk would be disastrous if he is anywhere besides the back so that's two is a certain. That leaves the front open, which I ended up being that and to be honest, isn't that big of a deal but it does give us a big weakness in our formation. For one, I'm technically shorter than any of them, even Ajiru is a good few inches taller than me. But luckily, the difference isn't that distinct. Mostly, it's just a matter of our seat being slightly sloped forward. As such, our horse is as follows, on the front, with Teku on the left while Ajiru handles the right. Our formation is one that focuses most on mobility, with two of us being speedsters of some kind, with our other blonde classmate being the outlier to act as an all-rounder support to us. Which is why I'm surprised no one even considered teaming up with him. Despite him being not that flashy or overpowering compared to our two most powerful classmates, he is definitely someone that would be a great addition to the team, especially in such a situation like this where his extra appendage could come in handy. Am I too heavy for you? Shinsu suddenly asked. He has his bandana around his head, with our total points of 665 displayed in bold red numbers. I can handle it. I tell him with a grin, besides, you're not that heavy. Hey, for the record, I've gained some muscle too, you know. Really? Because you still looked as thin as you were in middle school. Teku noted. Um, just for clarification. Ajiru chimes in, we're not going after Midoriya, right? It's our best option. Shinsu noted, with how the game is laid out, the fastest way to get into first is to take the 10 million as quickly as possible. That's what everyone would probably be doing once the rounds start. Instead, we'll hang back and steal from those who didn't head for him right away. Ah, and just to add, Monoma will be stealing from class 1A first. Teku added, well, I doubt he'll come to us right away. I pointed out, Shinsu is from the general course and Teku is his classmate, and if his stance on the whole class 1A versus class 1B is as you said, we're the last group of people he would steal from. Any plans on how to tackle this? Ajiru asked. We'll run in, take the headband, and get out. Shinsu explains, no need to get into a scuffle with anyone. We'll focus on getting as much points as we can. So then, guerrilla tactics. Guerrilla tactics. We affirmed to Ajiru, who simply shrugs and nodded. Formed your teams. Made your plans. Too bad if you haven't. Midnight signs off, here we go. The countdown to this brutal countdown. I steady myself as my aunt starts to count down the last few seconds. Okay, Jenko. Time to get your game face on. 3. I hear Shinsu cracking his knuckles above me. 2. I can feel the heat radiating from Teku's legs. 1. I suck in a deep breath as I push back one of my feet. Start. Almost immediately, two teams already make a dash for Midoriya's group as predicted, Tetsutetsu's group and Toru's group. Everyone else also made their move, us as well as we start running away from the scramble that is about to come. Okay, who's our first target? Teku asked. It'll be best if we stay away from Bakugou and Todoroki. I pointed out, at least, at the moment. Hey, hey. We all quickly turn and moved, barely dodging a running behemoth that nearly run us through in his rampage. A large burly teen that seems to have fur all over his body with his face being the exception, being rode by a Chinese-looking teen donning a braid who seems to be growing scales out of his forearm. No offense, Teku, but we'll be taking your points. He then fires said scales right at us. I quickly warns our rider, Shinsu, duck. No shit, Sherlock. I felt movement above me, probably Shinsu dodging said scales that also nearly hit me as a few came close to hitting my leg if I didn't move them out of the way. What do we do? Ajiro asked. Rush forward. Teku replies, Shishida has speed down, but if is basically a running tank. Great in acceleration, but sucks at tight turns. Got it. I immediately runs forward. I felt the heat from Teku's legs and the sound of Ajiro's tail hitting the floor as the weight tilts upward and forward. The lack of weight allowing me to go as fast as I could and it's exactly what I did. The surroundings speed past me as I moved past the large behemoth before skidding and turning our entire formation of full 180 as we all stopped. Looking for something. Shinsu said. Even without looking, I knew he has snatched the Chinese student's headband and is gloating at the fact. WH wa. Hey, how did you? The student then froze on the spot with blank empty eyes, clear signs of Shinsu's brainwashing in effect. Love to stay for a tussle, but we've got to run. He stated, now, fire your scales downwards. The three of us then runs away as I heard the burly teen cry out in shock in the background. Do you really need to gloat? Teku asked. It works, didn't it? He asked, besides, with how hot-blooded these people are in this match, it's the best way for me to use my quirk. You got a point there. Barely two minutes have passed, and the battlefield is already in chaos. Present Mike announces, with everyone scrambling for headbands, it's not just the 10 million out there. Those other high rankers are worth a shot, as well. Ah, oh, damn, I've forgotten about that. I noted wordly, forget Monoma's desire to outdo Class 1A, our team has both the second and third place students from the race. And with our combined points ranging in the 600s, it makes our headband as much as a price as Midoriya's. A sudden swoosh can be heard and I had a grunt from Shinsu, what was that? I asked before I stepped on something that to sink my feet into, what in the? I looked down into my surprise, found my leg covering in some kind of mucus-like substance, what is this? I tries to move my leg to find it stuck in place, I can't get out. 
That's, I heard Teku cried in surprise meaning that it much from someone in his class. But the whole mucus thing seems familiar. Got them, Monoma. Someone shouted as I managed to turn my attention to one of the team close by. The mount made of a large teen at the front with the weirdest looking head I have ever seen while the back on the right is our blonde American transfer student Pony Tsunotori while the left is the teen with what seems to be a manga speech bubble for a head. Being rode by a rather cute wallflower-esque teenage girl. With how the mucus is leaking out of his mouth like that, the substance must come from him. Thanks, Bondo. I heard someone shouted as a team runs up to us that is being rowed by Monoma. There are a few grunts above us as what I can assume is Shinsu fighting back the blonde teen's advances to get our two headbands. Not bad, for a mob-level grunt. GRR. Shinsu. Don't answer him. Teku shouted. Monoma's quirk can copy the quirks of anyone he touches. Which means, if the struggle above us is true, he must have grabbed his brainwashing quirk during the tussle. Well, that is just great. Hey, hey. It's not nice to just rat out our quirks to strangers like that, Naru-san. Monoma scoffed, but seeing as you are betraying us and working with the enemy, it's to be expected. He's mentally flipping you off, just to clarify. I tells him, as I said that, I decided to vibrate my trapped leg like how I did with Todoroki's ice, and manages to get my feet free, got free. Let's move. Not yet. Shinsu stated as I heard another grunt from him followed by a smack before tapping me on the head. Okay. Move, move, move. Moving. I quickly run, with the sound of a Jiro tail hitting the ground and the heat coming from Teku signaling my move as we speed away from the two teams, with sounds of something splatting on the ground as well as present Mike's commentary in the background. I skids to a stop, and unluckily near where Bakugu's team is. Damn it, shouldn't have just ran without looking where I am going. Phew. Ah, uh, great. I let out a groan at the blonde delinquent's screams as well as Shinsu's own grunt with the few signs of explosions above us. I turns to the red head in their group, Hey, Kirishima. Sup. He smirks while the heat from behind me spreads to my left for a moment. Tough match. Not really. I replied as the sound of Ajiro's tail hitting something echoes on my right. Got ambushed by one team that we managed to get their headband before running away, before getting ambushed again and barely manages to get away. Seriously, what is with people ambushing us? Shouldn't Midoriya be the number one target? Oh, cool. He nodded. Got to say, I'm surprised such a violent douchebag is our year's representative. Shinsu mocked him. So, how's your plan of getting first working for you? What do you say, you? I didn't even need to look to know that his brainwashing worked. Bakugou is definitely someone that Shinsu's quirk works best against with how egotistic and headed he is, especially against the art of provocation that Shinsu has perfected for people like him. Bakugou, I'll be taking that. Some slight movements above me later and then he tapped on my head once more, let's move. Oh, and please punch yourself in the eye for me. We all took to a run minus my quirk, a smack and a cry of pain in the background is more than enough to guess what happened. That is then followed by a scream of anger that is filled with all sorts of vulgarities that I'm pretty sure the ones handling the cameras are going to try and censor out. H-A-H-A-H-A. Thank you, Shinsu. Teku laughed as we ran, remind me to treat you to lunch soon, because that was epic. As much as I didn't want to admit it. Ajiro noted with a small chuckle, it is pretty nice to see Bakugou get wrecked like that. I'm definitely going to buy the recordings now. I laughed, I need to clip that part and put it on YouTube. Thank you, thank you, I'll be here all day. Shinsu noted with a chuckle, but it's not over yet. Damn right, it isn't. An explosion later, and we all saw Bakugou rocketing towards us with hands reaching out towards Shinsu. A blaze of fire from Teku manages to hold him away as the blonde delinquent moved to avoid getting burnt, but that didn't deter him as he simply goes around the flames before aiming straight at Shinsu. Jenko. Ajiro. On it. I quickly speeds to our side with the help of Ajiro's tail that pushes his weight up, turning our formation around with Teku acting as the axis, just enough that Shinsu is able to dodge out of Bakugou's hands. The tape come flying by and sticks onto the blonde delinquent's back and Ciro pulls him back towards his formation. Oh right, as long as our feet to touch the ground, anything is fair game. Shinsu noted. Come on, that is just cheating. I let out a groan at that. I knew Bakugou was going to do a move like that, just like in the manga, but seeing it firsthand. That is cool and terrifying all rolled into one. Maybe pissing him off isn't such a good idea. Ajiro points out. Hey, worth it. Same. Oh yeah, definitely. I can hear Ajiro's frustrations at our answer. Hey, Bakugo is pretty much a prissy prick 24-7. I added on. Besides, if not us, then Monoma would be the one that will get under his skin. And to be honest, I kind of wanted that to be the case and not us. But getting to see Bakugo getting triggered like that. Worth the risk. G-R-R-A-A-H-H-H. Bakugo shouted angrily, we're getting our points back, and then. I'm going to destroy all of you and get first place, says the one who got choked on sewage before entering UA. Shinsu points out, what, couldn't blow yourself out of a pinch, sludge victim one. Shut your trap, and punch yourself. I bit down a laugh as I get to watch Bakugou punch himself in the face again. Wow, for someone who I know is considered one of the few smart people in our class, he can be really, really dumb. Like, did he seriously just fall for the same trick twice? Okay, time to run. Shinsu tells us and I agree, the heat and sounds of impact is key enough for me to start running, speeding away from the screaming blonde. 
and right into another blonde who has several more headbands around his neck. There you are. Switch off. Huh. As speeds past him, I can hear the confusion in his voice as more explosions echoes behind us. Thank you for being the decoy, Monoma. Damn you. Come back here. Looks like the match is half over. Present Mike announces, Class B seems to have gained a huge advantage but Class is still high on the scoreboards. And in the midst of that, the battle for the 10 million crown commence. Whose head would be wearing that crown? I let out a loud sigh as we skid to a stop, feeling the remaining electric charge in my body slowly fades away. We're halfway done. How much points have we racked up? I asked. If the scoreboard is correct, Shinsu noted, around 1,600, give or take. We're at second place at the moment. Okay, then let's keep it that way. Teku noted, let's try to avoid conflict and focus on keeping our headbands. Ajiro-san, hold Shinsu's leg for a moment. I need to recharge. His tail moved to replace my hand as I dug into my pocket to get out a battery. But just as I took it out, sometimes slams into my wrist and causes me to drop the battery. What in the... Sorry, Jenko-chan. I can't let you do that. A voice shouted as a large blob of mucus is sprayed right towards us. We quickly moved out of the way of it as it splats harmlessly on the ground. Wait, that looks like... A swoosh later and I immediately, on reflexes alone, moved my head aside as a long horn-like projectile flew dangerously close to my face. H.A. Watch it, Sunotori-san. You could have popped my eye out. Oh, so terribly sorry. She calls out. Be careful, pony. The girl writing her commented, We want to trip them, not injury them. All right. This is bad. Not only am I out of juice, with Pony's horn projectile quirk, they have a huge range advantage over us. All she needs to do is grab one of our headbands from far range and we couldn't do much about it. Slippery. The teen with the speech bubble face suddenly shouted, and then a large stack hurragana words is spit out of his head that then slides under our feet. Then all of a sudden, my feet have no traction as my soles just slides all around like we're standing on ice itself. WH what's happening? Ajiro cried in shock. Crap. Fukudashi's quirk. Teku points out worriedly as we try to gain some form of balance. We'll be taking those. Pony suddenly shouted as she fires a couple of her horns right towards us, most likely aimed at Shinsu. Oh crap, we can't even dodge it like this. Everyone, hold on. He suddenly shouted, as heat intensifies from behind before we are launched forward at speeds close to what my top speed can be, the horn projectiles missing us by a far margin. Oh, I get it. Without traction, Teku can use his quirk to act as a rocket booster to push us forward. Ah, oh, damn it. Thanks for the save, but could you say something first? Shinsu cried as we skid around onto the ground that didn't feel like smooth ice. Yeah, a little warning would have been nice. Ajiro said angrily, I nearly tripped over my own tail. Hey, there was no time for me to do that. My childhood friend tells them. You guys can argue later. I berates them as I looked at the scoreboard, there's still about three minutes left. We got to survive until then. And then, a tape shoots past us, sticking on the floor next to us and is followed by what looks like a smooth acid-looking liquid being sprayed under it like some sort of path away to damn minute. Shit, shit, shit. If this is what I think it is. Jenko. Ajiro. Jump. We followed Teku's advice and leaped into the air as high as we can. A sudden heat from behind us is more than enough to guess what is his plan as we once again are launched forward. Just as Bakugou's team blast right towards us, the blonde berserker's hands barely reaching us when we manage to stick to landing. MMPH. Move, move, move. Yes, yes, yes. We all start running the heck away from Bakugou's team. No way we'll be able to deal with an enraged Bakugou like this. But wait. Hey, Shinsu. Can't you just trick him like you did the first two times? I asked. No luck. He shouted. He has tapped him own mouth shut. Damn it. Guess it's third time's the charm with him, huh? Teku noted. Less talking, more running. The last couple minutes were pretty hilarious and kind of embarrassing. For one, Bakugou being tenacious is a huge understatement. He just doesn't know the meaning of quitting as he just keeps on coming after us over and over again. It is either he just come right at us flying out of nowhere with his taped mouth screaming muffled profanities that I'm sure the camera crew is grateful for, or he would do the whole tape and acid plus explosion trick again. And time and time again, thanks to Teku's little flame idea that replaced my speed boost along with Shinsu's idea of using other teams to get in his way, we barely managed to get away. But eventually, time's almost up. Let's all count down together, everybody. Ten. Ten seconds left. I shouted, we just need to last ten no wait, nine. Nine more seconds. Nine. MMPH. Bakugou once again came flying right at us from his team. Eight. We leap forward, but then Teku let out a groan, overheat. Seriously. Shinsu shouted. Seven. Ajiro-san. I cried as the blonde delinquent comes ever closer. Six. On it. He swings his tail towards Bakugou's path. Five. But that didn't deter him as he simply fires an explosion right at the muscular tail, knocking it aside with a painful grunt from its owner. 4. The blonde delinquent reaches out to grab the headbands around Shinsu's neck. A grin is visible under his taped mouth with his victory almost certain. 
Three, however, Teku decided to throw a wrench into that as he pushes his body upwards, if the grip of his hand on my shoulder tightening means anything, and kicks backward towards Bakugu. Two, the blonde delinquent uses his explosion to go higher, the kick missing him completely. One, MMPH. He then launches at Shinsu once again, hands outstretched towards our rider. But then the horn sounds off and with a loud boisterous voice, present Mike proclaims to the stadium. Time's up. Bakugu, almost stiff from shock, flew right past Shinsu and face blunt spectacularly in front of me. I held back my chuckles as my middle school friend got back on the ground, visibly exhausted with both our headband and the three other bands we managed to secure around his head and neck respectively but have somewhat of a smirk on his face. Teku, on the other hand, wastes no time in laughing at the poor blonde, H-A-H-A-H-A. -H -A -H -A. Oh man, please let that be in the CDs later. M-M-P-H. What? Can't hear you over the noise of you losing. Okay, okay, settle down, you two PFD. M-M-P-H. I push my hand into my mouth as I tries to contain my hackles from spilling out on national television. I already feel in the glare the blonde delinquent is giving us. Oh man, I can't get that image of him face planting out of my head. The match is now over. Present Mike calls out, let's see the results now, shall we? In first place, Team Todoroki. In second place, Team Shinsu. Y-A-H-H. Divided by all right. We all cheered as I grabbed Shinsu and Teku into a three-way hug. We did it. We've passed the prelims. In third place, barely losing out by a small margin, Team Bakugu. M-F-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-
I quickly tell him, it's just, I didn't expect to meet you. They say they are getting pretty much every active hero in Mufasa City, but you're stationed in Hasu, aren't you? Ahaha, guess that's true. He chuckles, I'm not actually here on a job. Well, technically I am, but not the usual work. I'm here to scout for future potential heroes to join our agency. Scouting. You, I asked curiously. Now that I think about it, it does make some kind of sense. It has been stated that most pro heroes that came to spectate the sports festival is mostly here to look for any diamond in the rough, so to speak, to hopes to hiring them in the future. That's rare of you, brother. Ada points out with a chopping motion, you never has any interest in such things before. That's usually the case, but this year is special. He stated, looking at me, because Hermes San's daughter is participating this year. I, me, I asked curiously, why me? You see, Hermes San was my mentor in a sense. He pointed out my surprise. I had my first internship under his agency where he has taught me many things about the hero career. Even when I graduated from UUE and inherited Ingenium from Dad, I found myself calling him up for advice. Next to Dad, he's the one that made me the hero I am today. Dad did. I wasn't sure what I was expecting. To think that Dad, Dad of all people, has shaped one of the most well-known hero of his generation. So, when I heard from Ada that you're attending UUE as his classmate, I knew that when the sports festival came around, I have to see you in action for myself. He then grins at me, and I am thoroughly impressed. It's like I'm watching Hermes Santa's action again. I couldn't help but blush at the compliment. T thanks, I try. Oh, and Ada too. He added on, great job in passing into the second stage. I'm proud, baby brother. And that recipro burst. Great execution. Thank you. You are too kind. But it still could use some fine tuning. I suggest that you. The two brothers start conversing about their quirks, with me ending up like a third wheel all of a sudden. Man, to get compliments from Ingenium. A real pro hero for my actions. That's awesome. But then the repercussion of him being here starts to poke at my head and I realized what it meant. If Ingenium is here, and not back in Hasu City, that means that the whole Stain attacking and crippling him wouldn't happen, and that means that the whole Ada going full Sasuk on Stain wouldn't occur. Did, did I just save him just by existing? Man, butterfly effects and all that jazz, I didn't think this was possible. There goes any of my plans for the internship arc, guess I got to make altercations later. But then, if he wasn't the one that got attacked, then that means that someone else would be at the end of Stain's knife. And he or she might not be lucky to survive that encounter like Ingenium. Is that, really okay? Hello? You still there? H huh? I got out of my thoughts when Ingenium waves his hand in front of my face, he looking at me with worry. Huh, now that I look closely, he and Ada do look alike, with some small difference like eyebrow shaped and face structure. He zoned for a moment there. He points out, are you doing okay? Oh well, yeah, yeah, I'm doing fine. I laughed as I gave him a thumbs up, just thinking about the next part of the festival, that's all. Ah, that. He laughed, man, won't that be a spectacle? I'm looking forward to seeing you two in action. Thank you, brother. Ada raises his hand up with great enthusiasm, I won't let you down. I'm sure you won't. He chuckles, before turning to me and raising his hand towards me, it's nice meeting you, Tetsuya Jenko. I'll be watching closely. Make Hermes Sin's name proud. Why yeah? I nodded, grasping his hand in a firm handshake, I'll do my absolute best. Good. He chuckles, I'll be heading off then. As I watch the pro hero leave, nervousness starts to sink in. Man, oh man, talk about pressure now. I was just planning on doing my absolute best out there, but now I know that he is watching me. Oh boy, is this what Midoriya feels when he is out there? Tetsuya-san. Ida addresses as he turns to me, I know that we may not have interacted as much, but I wanted to say that next to Midoriya, you are the one that I wish to surpass more than anyone else. Hey, I was blown away at that declaration. What is he going on about? I thought the whole rival thing is only between Todoroki and Midoriya. Since the quirk assessment on our first day, I've seen you as someone that I need to challenge one day. He points out, speed has always been my family's greatest strength, as it is mine. But you, when you overtook me in the assessment with such ease, I knew right then that I have to overcome you if I were to take on my family's mantle one day. So, Tetsuya-san. He raises his hand up and thrust out a fist towards me, I'll be coming at you with all I've got. I blinked at that. I didn't think he was thinking like that this whole time. Come to think of it, he did have that intense stare whenever we are close to each other. I guess his serious personality goes that to him, huh? Teku, Shinsu, Midoriya to an extent, and now even Ada. How many rivals am I getting in this tournament? Even so, I grinned as I thrust out my fist in response, same here, Ida-san. It doesn't change anything. I'll be aiming for the top two. After lunch, which I barely made it in time and got to have at least somewhat of a meal, the festival continues. We all return to the stadium, rested and ready for the next part. But, HM, what's this? Present Mike stated over the comms as we all got into our classes. It looks like Class A and B seems to have a bit of change in costume. Not that I mind, if you know what I'm saying, but I wonder why. You tricked us, Kaminari-kun. Momo shouted rather angrily. As for why she is angry, apparently Kaminari, with help from his newly acquired comrade in mind, manages to somehow convince both Momo and Class B's Kendo that the girls are to join the cheerleaders after lunch, that it is in order for Maizawa and Vlad King. 
and that ended up with all of us, me including because I was too dumb to realize that it was a ploy from them before it was too late, wearing the same revealing cheerleader outfit as the actual American cheerleaders dancing about. Minta, you damn perverted pig. I glance over to Class B for a moment to confirm my suspicions, as Teku is getting held back by that large hairy student from the cavalry battle and is screaming at the grape-haired student who gave Kaminari a high five when they passed each other. How could I have let myself get tricked by such a stupid prank? My tall ebony-haired classmate mutters dejectedly with Uraraka consoling her over it. I even used my quirk to make these outfits. Those damn pervert idiots. Jiru stated angrily as she tosses the pom-poms on the ground. I don't know. I stated as I took a look at myself and spun a little letting the skirt flutter up a bit, I kind of like the outfit. I really wanted to wear this in my previous life, but due to my alignment, I never got the change to do so. Yeah, yeah. Hagakure noted shaking her pom-poms rather excitedly. I mean, we're already dressed for it, why now just roll with it? You seem to enjoy these things, Toru-chan. Suya said with croak. I'm so sorry for all of this. Kendo apologized to us. No, no, it's fine. Ashido assures her, no harm done. W well. Ahem, minus the little. Wardrobe change, I like to welcome everyone back. Present Mike tells us, now, before we move on the final event, I've got good news those out of the running. As this is still a sports festival, we've prepared a few recreational activities for all participants. Hope you all enjoy this little recreational competition. But once it is over, we're on to the final event. Between the 16 members of the four winning teams, we'll have a formal tournament. A series of one-on-one -on -one battles. A tournament, huh, Hiroshima noted, so we'll be up in that ring I see on TV every year. Was it a tournament last year too? Ashido asked. The format's always different, but most of the time it involves some kind of head-to-head -head competition. Siro tells her, last year, it was foam sword fighting. The matchups will be decided by drawing lots. Midnight tells us holding up the polling box. They sure like their polling boxes, don't they? Once that is settled, we'll move on to the festivities and then the tournament itself. It's up to each of you 16 finalists whether or not you participate in the fun. I expect some of you would rather take a breather and save your strength. Now, let's start with the first place team. After a series of drawing lots one after another as well as confirmation on who among us is going to join in the recreational activities, we got our first matchups for the tournament. It goes as follows. Midoriya vs. Shinsu. Todoroki vs. Siro. Me, Tetsuya vs. Kaminari. Ada vs. Hatsum. Ashido vs. Takoyami. Yeyurazu vs. Teku. Ajiru vs. Kirishima. Uraraka vs. Bakugu. Some of the matchups followed the canon, if I remember correctly, but a few exceptions came out. Like how Ashido is going up against Takoyami in the first round instead of maybe Teku or Ajiru, considering that Ayama didn't make it to the final event. But when I saw my matchup, I'm not sure whether I should be happy that it might be an easy victory, or let down as I might not be able to show off my stuff in the beginning. Guess I'll have to bring it my all with Ida in the next round. Also, with these matchups, it is assured that I might have to go against Todoroki in the semi-finals. And that, I am not looking forward to it. My quirk is completely useless compared to his, and I have no way to negate his attacks like Midoriya's one-for-all smashes. Sure, he broke his fingers and arm doing so, but at least he didn't suffer an instant knockout. Sorry, Siro. Luck is not on your side. Speaking of luck, Shinsu would have to deal with Todoroki as he made it past Midoriya, right? Not sure how he is going to deal with it, seeing as the cool son of Endeavor isn't the type to strike up a conversation so easily. Add in his animosity to his father. Yeah, he doesn't stand a chance. Sorry, Shinsu. Now that I look closely, with how the matchups are distributed, wouldn't that mean that Teku would have to fight with Bakugou after all? He is definitely going to enjoy that. Now, let's set aside the tournament for the time being, and get on with the thrill of minute festivities. With that last announcement, the audience cheers as more fireworks are fired into the sky while Midnight starts to explain each of the recreational events to us. So, I'm dealing with Midoriya first, huh? Shinsu spoke up as he got next to me, it's going to difficult, seeing that he knows about my quirk and all. Oh, you'll figure it out. I assures him with a smile, you've got three years of martial arts training under your belt, right? Use that to your advantage. Yeah, you're right. He smirks, although you've got the luckiest draw among all of us. Kaminari, he's the guy who was shocking everyone during the cavalry battle, right? Yup, the same one. You are going to steamroll all over him. Definitely. I stated with small sigh, guess I'll have to leave impressing the heroes to my match with Iida-san. Oh yeah, that glasses guy. Isn't he the one who berates Midoriya during the entrance exam? He asked, what does he want with you? Oh, nothing. Just wanted to introduce his brother, Ingenium, to me. I stated, and hear this. Apparently, my dad taught him everything he knows about hero work. Well, seriously, I was just as surprised as you. Hey guys, Teku walks up to us, what did I miss? Just Jenko telling us that her dad has taught Ingenium everything about hero work. Shinsu tells him, wait, seriously. My childhood friend cries out in shock that Ingenium, the turbo hero that is considered one of the fastest heroes of the nation, was taught by your dad. Yeah, not only that, he's in the audience at this very moment. I bounced a little from the excitement. Oh, I'm definitely going to bring out everything I have for this. I'm going to impress him with all I got. 
Ha, yeah, he'll definitely be impressed, Shinsu noted with a smirk. The recreational activities after the announcements are lots of fun to have. It is mostly the standard sport festival stuff, with a few minor changes here and there to make them more flashy than usual. Too bad there's now tower topping, but considering what some of our classmates' quirks can do. Yeah, it's a given to exclude that. I didn't participate in any of the activities myself, deciding to cheer my class along with my female classmates. Got to say, despite being the result of a perverted scheme, I sure have lots of fun being a cheerleader. Anyways, with all those activities out of the way, it's finally time for the event that everyone is waiting for. Hey, guys, are you ready? Prezen asked the spectating crowd that lets out loud cheers that reverberate across the stadium. You've been through hell to get here, but now it's time for the one-on-one -on -one tournament. You've only got yourself to rely on. Even if you're not a hero, this saying holds true. You know it. Spirit, technique, wisdom, and knowledge. Use them all and show us your best. And without further ado, here's the first match of the day. Our classes are allocated into special audience boxes close to the stage, one for each of our classes. I managed to get the front seat, changed back to my Yui tracksuit, and seating next to Tsuyu and in front of Ishido. If I remember correctly, in order to find the match, you are to either knock your opponent out of the ring, immobilizing them or getting them to surrender. The ways to accomplish that are virtually limitless, as there are no rules against fighting as dirty as you can. Of course, killing is heavily forbidden. Oh boy, here we go. I muttered as I watch as my middle school friend and my classmate walks up into the ring. To my knowledge, this fight isn't all that impressive in canon, with Shinsu never having any prior martial arts training and Midoriya is still having trouble handling one for all. But in this timeline, in my reality, things are different. How different is the fight going to be, I wonder. Making a weird face despite his excellent performance, it's Hero Course's Midoriya Izuku. Versus, sadly, he hasn't made much of a splash yet but as people guessing, it's General Course's Shinsu Itoshi. From what I am sitting, the two of them stood a good distance away from each other, with Shinsu stretching his arms while Midoriya is doing something similar with his knuckles as present Mike explains the rules of the tournament. From an outsider's perspective, Shinsu has a huge disadvantage in this fight. Despite not using at full power, Midoriya's full cowl ability gains him a significant boost in speed and strength that he could easily overpowers him. But unknown to many, excluding Midoriya, he has ways to dealing with such quirks. After all, he has plenty of practice dealing with mine and Tekus. Midoriya sure got a tough one of the get-go. As Shido points out, Yeah, Kirishima nodded, with his quirk, once he got a hold on you, it's game over. Is he that difficult to deal with? Kaminori asked. Bakugou got caught in it and couldn't even fight against it. Oh yeah, he blown himself up a few times back in the cavalry battle. Who blow himself up? Hi. Huh. The blonde delinquent shouted angrily, and he just got lucky. No way I'm getting caught in that thing again. You got caught back in the cafeteria, though. Suyu points out. Wait, really? I asked, ignoring Bakugou's shouts in the background, what did he made him do? Do that a picture. Here. She took out her phone and shows me the picture she took. I nearly fall off my seat laughing. The photo showing the exact moment when Bakugou dunks his head into a large bowl of miso soup. Oh, man, I got to get Shinsu to do this more often. Shut the fuck up, Blondie. Now, let's get this thing started. Present Mike announced over the comms, R E E A A D D D Y Y Y Y. I brought my attention back to the match as I awaited excitedly for the match to begin. Midoriya got into a loose fighting stance. The power of one for all flows through his body as he actives full cowl. Shinsu sends Quirk as a trigger to activate, answering his question. As long as I don't speak, I'll be fine. Just focus on getting him out of the ring. Do not open your mouth. Just focus. Shinsu himself got into a fighting stance as well, he knows my quirk, so he'll be cautious about speaking. His breath steadies as he readies himself, Midoriya's quirk is insanely powerful and has the speed to match. But he has a habit of charging at things ahead. And once he got close, start. On pushing him out, I'll trap him. A green-haired teen rushes forward, going straight ahead towards his opponent at top speed. His purple-haired opponent is ready for his charge and stood his ground as Midoriya strike a palm strike to push Shinsu to the ground, only for him to dodge the strike and grab his arm before kicking his legs and throwing the one-for-all user onto the ground and out of full cowl. Once they are on the ground, he maneuvers his body to pin his opponent down in a standard wrist lock. Oh, what's this? Just one move and Midoriya is pinned down. Damn, this Shinsu fella. He's something else. Kind of reminds me of you, Eraserhead. Is that so? Midoriya grunts in pain as he struggles to move his pinned arm, which Shinsu responds with pulling it towards himself even more. This is bad. I've miscalculated. I've forgotten his throws and grabbles. There are ways to deal with quirks like yours, Midoriya. Shinsu tells him with a grin as he tightens his hold, and I have plenty of experience dealing with them. Calm down. The green-haired hero to be thought hastily, this isn't over yet. Keep full cow going. One for all surges through his body and using that new strength, he uses his freed arm and pushes against the ground as hard as he could. Oh, ho! Oh. looks like Midoriya is fighting back. Slowly but surely, he lifts himself up and pushes Shinsu off of him before running back and gaining a good distance away from him. Damn, Shinsu muttered out as he got back on his feet. And he got out. Any longer, and it's game over for him. 
If I keep my distance away from him, he can't use a grapple to pin me down. Midoriya thought as he massages his wrist, but I also can't push him out without getting close. Except, maybe, but the risks. A wrist lock isn't good enough. Shinsu thought, looks like I need to get him in an arm lock. And for that, hey, Midoriya. He shouted out to him, can't come close now, can't you? Guess it goes to show that no matter how good a quirk is, it's useless if you can't use it right. A real wasted potential there. His opponent bit his lips in an attempt to stop himself from responding. But that's not a problem for me. He stated he walks forward, my quirk may have very gimmicky, but it can be used anywhere, anyone, anyhow. Compared to yours, mine seems a lot better, isn't it? Looks like that golden ticket of yours isn't worth a damn thing. It's all been for nothing in the end. You take the, got you. In the moment he realized what he has done, Midoriya has locked himself into a trance via brainwashing. That was a close one. Shinsu sighed as he picked up the pace. Sorry, Midoriya, but that's the only way I know to get a reaction out of you. Hope you'll forgive me. Shinsu's coming in for another attack. But Midoriya is not moving at all. What's going on? Not good. Not good. I can't believe I fell for that. Midoriya berates himself in his mind as he struggles in vain to move. Damn it. Damn it. I've gotten so far. After what everyone has done for me. It can't end like this. It's over, Midoriya. Shinsu states as he took to a run, ready to tackle him to the ground. Move. Then, something happened. In the green-haired teen mind, an image is shown. A vision of eight different shadowy figures standing in of him. Each of them of various sizes and shapes but all distinctly human. One of them even has two antennae-looking cowlicks sticking up from his head. And in that same moment, he felt one of his hands freed from the control, flowing with the inherited quirk's power. And within that singular moment of freedom, he moves fingers and flicks his index finger downwards. The resulting impact sends a shockwave flying in all directions, kicking up clouds of dust around him. Shinsu, who is not prepared for the sudden movement, is thrown backwards by the shockwave, sending him tumbling onto the concrete floor. How is he able to move? He wonders as he got back up on his feet. From within the cloud of dust, Midoriya gasps as he felt the sudden pain of his broken finger. W what was that just now? An illusion. He then recalls what All Might had said about One for All, it's passed down like a torch. Was those the past users of One for All? He shook his head. Not the time to think, it is a time for action. He quickly fires up One for All and enter full cowl, before rushing out of the dust clouds at full speed. Seeing his opponent coming straight at him, Shinsu readies himself to trap him into another grapple. But Midoriya knew he would do that, as such at the last second, to Shinsu's shock, he cartwheels over him to avoid his counter. While in the air, he raises his hand towards the purple-haired teen and concentrate 100% of one for all on his middle finger and flicks it as hard as he can. The shockwaves from the move blew straight towards a stunned Shinsu, blowing him backwards towards the ring's edge. He digs his soles in the ground as hard as he can to stop himself from moving, but to no avail as he eventually trips over himself and tumbles across the edge, landing just before the stairs. Midoriya himself nearly crossed the edge as well, tumbling to a stop just an inch from the line, barely dodging a lost. Shinsu, ring out. Midnight announces, Midoriya advances to the second round. And we have a winner. Midoriya of Class 1A advances on. Oh Lord Mighty, we are off to an eventful start, my listeners. Give our two great competitors a big round of applause. As the crowd clapped and cheered for the winner, Shinsu and Midoriya have gotten back up and walk up to each other. The purple-haired teen gave a small huff before raising his hand up to his opponent. Good match, Midoriya. Sorry for all the mean stuff I said back there. I didn't mean a single word of it. No hard feelings. Midoriya grimaced a little, before smiling and grasping the hand, and then regretted it as it was his injured hand that he used. Shinsu notices this and quickly let go and put up his other hand instead, which Midoriya grasps onto instead, no hard feelings. Thank you for the match. Look at that sportsmanship, folks. What a show of good faith. This is what the sports festival has been all about. I let out a small whine at the match's results, oh. He's so damn close. It was a close match, Kiro. Suyu stated, I didn't think Shinsu san knew judo. He definitely got Midori on the ropes, that's for sure. Kaminari pointed out. I'll say. Kirishima nodded, he got some moves. Yeah, it's like watching a kung fu flick. Ishido stated energetically while throwing out some mock punches. He's no master, but he definitely got the fundamentals down. Najiro noted, and his techniques aren't half bad. He has to been training a lot. But Midori Kun still blew him away. Hagakur stated. Way to go, Deku Kun. Your rocket cheered on. MM, as expected of Midoriya. Ida nodded robotically. TCH, damn Deku. Bakugu grumbles on angrily. Still as bitter as always, isn't he? Shinsu, hope he isn't feeling too depressed over the match. He trained so hard for it too. My phone then rings to my surprise. I opening it to the group chat between me, Teku and Shinsu, with a message from Shinsu that makes me smile. To be continued. I'll make, go, class 1A, go. Jenko cheers with all her might as her fellow classmates cheering along with her, at least those who are kind of willingly to do so. The punk rock girl, Jiru, is just sitting down watching her classmates perform improv cheers with little to no coordination. Zenko then turns to her with an eager cheer, Come on, Jiru-san. Lift those palms palms. I never said I want to. She pouted, Besides, this is all that pervert Kaminari's fault. 
Why should I go along with his wishes? Because it's fun. Both she and Hagakir stated with a smile, or at least Jenko is smiling while the invisible girl just did the smiling sound effect. You two sure are cut from the same cloth, Toru-chan, Jenko-chan. Suyu noted. You think so? Hagakir wonders. Tatsuya-san. They all stop cheering as Shoji runs up to them, let me borrow you for a second. Huh, why? He then turns over a piece of paper that indicates what item he needs for the borrowing race. On said paper is the words written in bold text. Um, Jenko embarrassing rubs her neck, I'm flattered, but my mom's European, so. You have blonde hair. He pointed out, close enough. Right. She struggles to keep her blush down as she is piggyback towards the finish line on the large teen's back. Chapter 17, Sport Festival, Tournament, Part 2. The next match is Siro against Todoroki, and we all know how this match is going to go down from the get-go. I blinked and all of a sudden an ice spike is a few inches away from my nose. Damn, Todoroki, that's kind of an overkill, don't you think? If I didn't feel sorry for Siro then, I definitely am now. He really picked the worst card in this scenario, didn't he? Needless to say, the winner is the dual tone hair team. After that, it is my turn. I stood in the arena, my hands trembling with excitement, with Kaminari standing opposite me in a similar state. I can still feel the cold from Todoroki's ice lingering in the air, unsurprisingly. Now that the arena is all thought out, it's time for the next match. Present Mike announced, the fastest woman in this stadium and the Queen of Lightning. The Empress of Speed, it's Tetsuya Jenko. Versus, the sparkling, killing boy, Kaminari Denki. Quite a name you got. Kaminari tells me, I could only nervously chuckle at that with my cheeks filled red. Got to hand it to present Mike, he knows how to hype up the place. I'm not sure about the whole Empress of Speed title, though. Well all I got is sparkling boy. He let out a dejectedly sigh, man, it's like nobody is taking me seriously. When you go all dumb dumb after expelling too much voltage, it's hard for anyone to take you seriously. Is what I want to point out but choose not to, to keep some of his dignity intact. Besides, lightning quirks are often the most devastating quirks out there, if Marvel's Thor in the infamous series has taught me that much. I wonder if he could get a similar weapon to Cole Macgrath, maybe an electric baton of some sort. Just to let you know, the blonde electric teen smirks as he took to a stance, I'm not to go easy on you just because you are cute. Um, thanks. I blinked as I got into a boxing stance as well. Okay, now how is he going to do this? He must know that electricity isn't going to work with me, so he might go for hand to hand. If what I remember from our first battle trial on the second day in school, Kaminari isn't too shabby in the CQC category, a somewhat average brawler. But that was almost a month ago, and a lot can change in that short period of time. He might have improved his combat skills since then. re Start. This will only take a moment. Then Kaminari betray all my expectations of him actually using his brain and charge up his AoE voltage attack. Um, you know I absorb electricity, right? I pointed out to him. No duh. But, even if you absorb all that electricity, there's only a set limit of voltage you can absorb at one time, right? Wait, is he planning on? So what happens when you exceed that limit, I wonder? One million volts. With that, he releases all his voltage all around him, with the electric charge that didn't get grounded flowing right at me which I then slams my hand on the ground and start absorbing the voltage. True, my body has a limit of amount of voltage I can allow to absorb at one given time, and if I exceed could harm my nerves irreparably. Learn that the hard way when I stuck a fork into the power socket at the age of eight, not a pleasant experience at all. But I also know that just moving around use up more voltage than I can absorb, and the faster I go means using more voltage in general. As such, once I feel I hit my cap limit, I immediately dash as forward at him in the fastest speed I am currently capable of. The surroundings blur for a moment, before Kaminari's shocked derpy-looking face appear for an instant which I then land a sucker punch right into, dispelling his electric attack and sending him tumbling across the arena before stopping at just the edge of the ring. I hear the entire stadium fall silent for a moment, Midnight blinked for a moment before regaining her composure as she looked at my fellow blonde student, and then gave out her verdict, Kaminari's down. Katsuya Jenko advances to the second round. I it's over. I blinked and it's over. Present Mike screams in astonishment, what a match. That didn't take even a minute to end. I quickly ran over to my classmate to check on him, and sure enough, his nose seems to be dented in with trails of blood flow from his nostrils. I thought I feel his nose broke under my knuckles. Oops, sorry, Kaminari. Please, oh please let it just be a concussion. I am only willing to leave once the nurse bots arrived and put Kaminari on a stretcher before wheeling off towards the medical ward. On my way back, I ran into the one whose matches after mind. Hey, Hiro-san. I greeted him with a wave before noticing him wearing some gear. Um, what are those? Oh, these are the support items given to me by Hatsum. He tells me with a robotic wave of his hand, she gave them to me in hopes for us to be on equal footing in this match. Uh, huh. I'm pretty skeptical about her reasons being so noble. In the manga, she isn't the type of person who would do such a thing, and didn't she use the tournament as advertisement of sorts? Well, I must be off. 
he tells me as he jogs, match off towards the arena, see you in the quarterfinals. Why yeah, sure, I nodded in response, when I heard the pink-haired inventor's loud voice echoing through the walls as she starts her sales pitch on her inventions, I let out a small sigh. Ada Sam, you just got played. Thankfully, Kaminari only has a concussion from my strike along with a broken nose that Recovery Girl is capable of mending. He is discharged by the time Ada's match is over, with a medical patch over his nose for his troubles. The next match after the sales pitch fight, which I'm sure is going to leave our class president completely dejected about the whole thing since his brother is here in the stadium and has shown such a rather humiliating play, is Ashido against Takoyami, and let me be perfectly honest, it couldn't be any more one-sided. Takoyami's quirk, Dark Shadow, has one heck of a reach and is pretty much a JoJo stand made manifest. Ashido's quirk couldn't make a single dent in his defense, which he then slowly and surely forces her back till she left the ring, earning him that win within about a couple of minutes. Now, the next one after them, that's something I'm paying close attention to. We are a quarter of the way done with the first round, people. Let's get all pumped up in here. Present Mike speak up about it. For this match, he's the definition of hot-blooded. The only member of Class 1B in this tournament, it's Naruteku. Suck it, any ITO. I let out a small groan and chuckle at his reaction to his introduction. Of course, he is going to use this chance to be as smug as possible. If there's one thing I know about Teku, is that he likes to rub his victory against people he has grudges with. And boy, does he keep his grudges. Um, V versus All-Purpose Creation. She came in on recommendation, so her skills are certified, it's Yeirazu Momo. That guy, huh, Siro noted, Yeirazu is going to have a really tough time dealing with him. I'll say, Kirishima nodded, Teku is pretty tough opponent for Yeirazu. His quirk is pretty straightforward, but he manages to make it work in multitude of ways. But Yeomomo is pretty tough too. Mina argued back, go, Yeomomo, kick his butt. Hey, Kirishima-san. I turned to the red-haired teen, isn't your match after theirs? Ajiro-san has already left, you know. Oh crap, you're right. He leaped off his seat before rushing off. This is going to be tricky. Teku knows of Yeirazu's quirk, if what occurred during what he dubbed in his head as the Mind a Cheerleader Perversion incident is any indication, and how versatile it can be in all sorts of situations. Creation. With that versality, if I let her have a chance to counterattack, I'll be a goner. Start. With that in mind, the moment the signal for the match to start is announced, he jumps literally into action by igniting his feet and rocketing towards her and slamming a flaming kick right at her. Oh, and Naru made the first move. She is able to create a shield in time to block his attack, but is pushed back by the sheer weight behind his attack. Don't let up. Keep her off balance. He is then followed by another kick, and another, and another, and another as he let loose a flurry of flaming kicks at her shield, she barely keeping it up with each attack sending her back one step with each hit. What ferocity. It's kick after kick after kick. He doesn't even give Yeirazu time to breathe. Such heavy kicks. And so fast too. The black-haired girl is unable even attempt to counter-attack as the relentless attacks force her to keep her guard up and not let her enough time to create a weapon to do so. With one final kick, Teku pushes himself off of her shield and lands a good distance away, crouching in a sprinter position. Yeirazu quickly used this small breathing time to create a Kali stick and prepare to counter her opponent next attack. What she didn't expect is for Teku to ignite his feet at such ferocity and then rockets at her to deliver a dropkick at speed she didn't think he is capable of. She quickly lifts up her shield to defend herself and blocks the attack, but that in turn sends her flying and tumbling back onto her back. She quickly got back up and prepares to fight back, but, ring out, Midnight's declaration rung across the stadium, shocking the black-haired girl before she looks down at her feet to find that she has one foot already outside the ring. Fei has been pushing me towards the edge this whole time, and it's over. Naro Teku is proceeding to the next round. Teku pumps his fist, letting out small victory cry. His opponent could only stare in shock as she drops her creations onto the ground, I couldn't even. Ah, uh, Yeomomo lost. Ashido groaned. Well, that's anticlimactic. Sato stated in surprise, didn't expect it to be so one-sided. Yeirazu couldn't strike back at all. Takoyami noted. yeirazu sans quirk is strong, but if she can't use what she creates it's pretty much useless. I pointed out, I guess Teku is aiming for that when he made the first move. But to think it would end so quickly like that. Jiro noted. Strange, isn't it? A very familiar and equally annoying voice shouted at us. We all turned to the wall that separated the classes into their respective booths, and on top of said wall is 1B's own notorious blonde troublemaker, Mano Manito. For someone of the amazing class wanted to be defeated so one-sidedly. Isn't that girl the one of the recommended students? How strange for someone of such outstanding stature get defeated so easily. And that's enough out of you. A heavy chop later, and Monoma's gloating is put to a stop and pulled off the wall by Class 1B's class president, I'm so sorry for this. Kendo apologized as she drags him back into the booth. Man, what a buzzkill. Ashido pouted. I'll say. Hagatur nodded, I think. It's kind of hard to tell with her being invisible and all that. The next fight between Kirishima and Ajiro is pretty average, to say the least. At first, Kirishima seems to have the advantage as Ajiro has no way around his hardening quirk. 
but then the tailed teen took a page out of Teku and keeps on hitting his opponent without relenting, and with enough force that he could push him back a bit at a time. Thanks to this, he is able to push Kirishima Mick enough to the edge of the ring, and uses his tail to trip him, causing his leg to fall out of the edge and earn him a win. What can I say? Average win for the most average person in our year. The matchup afterward is a 1-to-1 exact to the manga. It is Bakugou versus Yuraka, and like in the manga, it is pretty one-sided in Bakugou's favor. He keeps on blasting explosions after explosions right at the girl with full force whenever she got close. The brunette doesn't stand a chance at all and each explosion is another burn and bruise on her. But despite all that, she keeps getting back up and kept on charging at him. Sure enough, the audience around us all starts to boo at Bakugou for his harsh behavior, and then Aizawa proceeds to tear into the pro heroes in the audience for acting and judging so poorly. A moment later, everything came together. Using Bakugou's own explosions, Yuraka manages to gather enough rubble that she suspended in the air using her gravity quirk. And thanks to Bakugou's own explosions creating a smoke scream around them, he didn't notice it at all until she removed her quirk and sends all the rubble crashing down atop of them in a miniature meteor shower. Sadly, her plan is foiled with the blonde delinquent blasting away the rubble meteors with a huge explosion. Even so, she gets up to try again, only to fumble and collapse from exhaustion, earning Bakugou that win. I saw Midoriya slipping away to prepare for the match ahead, the match I know is the highlight in the whole arc. This time, however, Midoriya is much stronger than the one in the manga and has more control over the one for all. Add to the fact that he has some level of martial prowess due to sparring with me, Teku and Shinsu, he might be the strongest he could ever be at this point of time. Is he strong enough to stand up against Todoroki of all people? We can only wait and see. Oh, rough match out there, huh, villain face. Siro's comment brought me out of my thoughts. Bakugou making his way into the booth with a scowl on his face. Awkward matchups aside, you do great at playing the bad guy, Bakugou. Shut the hell up, all of you. He screams at us. No, really. Nice job in blowing up that frail little girl. Kaminari sarcastically remarked, not like me. I held back against mine. I'm pretty sure you went full out in our match, Kaminari. I pointed out to him, full 100 million volts. Oh, come on, Tetsuya-san. HMPH. Bakugou huffed as he sits down on the seat before muttering out, what part of her is frail? Idiots. Please don't make me ship you two together, Bakugou. Midoriya stopped himself from going back into the preparation room when he heard the sobs behind the door. Of course she's broken up over it. Why wouldn't she be? He clenched his fists, winching from the shot of pain from his broken and healing fingers. I said I want to return the favor, but in the end, I couldn't do anything at all. Even so, she. Good luck out there. I'm rooting for you. Her encouraging words echoes in his mind as he rubs away the tears threatened to spill over. He wouldn't let her down. Her, All Might, Teku, Shinsu and Jenko, he'll take their encouragement and pressed on. A sudden heat stopped him in his tracks as Endeavor of all people walks out from around the corner. Oh, he Endeavor, there you are. The flaming hero walks up to him, the flames on his huge frame that parallels All Might's make an intimidating presence, I was looking for you. F for me, Midoriya wonders. I saw what you did out there. He tells him, that's an amazing quirk you got, creating such a force with just a flick of your finger. In terms of power, it seems in par with All Might's quirk. The green-haired teen flinched at that observation, D does he know. No, he doesn't from how he explained it. But it has to stay a secret from him, especially him. If he finds out, W what are you T talking about? He fumbles through his words before nervously walking off, W well, I have to get going. My boy, Shoto, he has a duty to surpass All Might. That sentence stopped him, and ever took that as a sign that he is listening and carries on. His match against you will prove a valuable test for that. So give it your all. Put up a good fight against him. Words of Todoroki spilling his reasons for challenging him echoes in his head. Of his abusive childhood, of his estranged relationship with his father, of his conviction of denying him everything by not using the part of him that he got from said father, everything just flashes in his mind. Now that he has heard the words from Endeavor himself, Midoriya now fully understand the depths of Todoroki's hatred towards him. The sheer abhorrence he has towards the man that made up half of his blood and his quirk. He understood it right there and then. But at the same time, that's all I have to say. Endeavor turns away to head for the stands, sorry for my bluntness. I'm not all might. H.M. The number two hero stopped in his tracks as he turns to face him, well, of course you're not. That's right, I'm not. Midoriya continues, before looking back with a scowl on his face, and Todoroki-kun isn't you. The man's eyes narrowed at that proclamation as the green-haired teen walks toward the stadium. Midoriya now knows what he has to do. To be continued. I'll make. Guess who made it to the second round? Teku walks into his class's booth with his fists in the air as he made it to his seat. You did excellent out there. Kendo congratulated him. It was amazing, Teku. Pony stated with a smile. I knew you had it the moment you send that girl flying back with that kick. Tetsu Tetsu nodded in agreement as he fist bumps him. Man, that was badass. I'll say. Setsuna patted his back with a grin. You'll made it to finals no problem. Aha, uh -huh, I wouldn't be so sure. Monoma points out, his entire class turns to face him. The only reason he won is because his opponent isn't well suited against him. Hit him with someone like, I don't know, Todoroki. He'll be absolutely destroyed. I'm sorry, who made it into the tournament? 
Teku points out as he walks up to him, Look, I know you don't like me because I hang out with our enemies, but you don't have to be such a dick about it. I'm just making a logical observation. He stated with a shrug of his shoulders, I'm also saying that only got lucky with her, and luck wouldn't hold out for you for long. Teku huffed as he walks away and took his seat, of course, I knew that. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku like Ock becomes Flash. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout out to Terius123 for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Quirky What If for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.